Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. A girl of 18 years old stepped out with bare feet onto a porch whose boards had been itching for a long time. After many years, the girl had the beautiful name Victoria. She had just woken up and went outside to watch the weather in her right foot. And with her left, she reached out and with her arms up stretched her whole slender body. Her long hair scattered over her semi-naked shoulders and back. She squinted against the morning sun. A cool, fresh breeze was blowing, and everything was beautiful until a loud cow roar sounded, causing the girl to come to her senses and think about the coming before and by whom. Standing, a few more seconds of tenderness under the sun's rays, Victoria returned to the house. She quickly washed her face, twisted her hair into a toga bump, and put on a light-colored long dress. When she entered the kitchen, her mother and father were already sitting at the table. There was oatmeal porridge and freshly baked scones with poppy seed and cream for breakfast. Victoria reached her hand out for a ruddy, flavorful bun, but was immediately slapped by her mother. Where are you taking the sweets? Eat first, she said, piercing her with a look. Victoria put the bun back on the table and began to nibble on her oatmeal. Victoria's mother, whose name was Adriana, was always watching what her family ate. She also wanted her daughter to stay in good shape. After all, for an unmarried young girl, that meant a lot. Andrew, today we need to bring hay and sawdust, she asked, turning to her husband and spreading a fat layer of cream on the bun. Victoria looked at the appetizing bite. I'll bring it back if I have to, her father replied. I continue counting breakfast and you, my daughter, will stay for the gorilka today. Adriana put the teaspoon into the cream again and then sent it into her mouth. She didn't notice the surprised looks of Victoria, who had no plans to work the evening shift. What she got this time? She tried to be indignant when she finally finished her porridge. Don't worry, she'll take over for you another time, her mother reassured her as she sipped her tea. That's it, I'm going to go clean up the table, father. Andrew he was a man of thick and stocky build. He had big brown eyes and a short cropped beard and mustache. He was always measured and calm, which could not be said of Adriana, who was always rushing around and pushing her husband around. With her parents gone, Victoria was alone. Finally, she could enjoy a sweet bun with cream in complete privacy. But unfortunately, every time afterward, a plate of oatmeal is eaten. There was simply no room left in her stomach for the coveted treat, peering into the half bun. Victoria shoved a spoonful of cream into her mouth and left the table. Twenty minutes later, having moved into the kitchen, the girl was already pacing the farm. On her shoulder she carried a bag with a long sack over which hung a headscarf. Victoria admired the scenery of the open field of a sparse birch grove. Birds hung all about, playing, flying from one bush to another. The girl liked her native place, but she dreamed of a better life, a big city, a cozy spacious apartment, and a well-to-do husband. Her mother herself had set her up for this from childhood. She believed that life is successful only when you have a rich husband, who will also have some power. And Victoria took her mother's notion as her own. Especially, what's wrong with having great opportunities and a decent income? Victoria reached the cow reduction farm which was coming from a large coral. She already realized that the horned animals had been waiting for a long time to give milk and ease their burden. Come on, my good one, come on, come on, coaxed Victoria, trying to negotiate with the cow to take the right pose. The girl then took a jar of cream and applied a small amount of it for a while to wear it. She proceeded to the blackboard. Her fingers grasped clearly and coherently, releasing the nipple. Thin white lines of milk rushed into the pail, hitting its wall. They made a tinkling, lingering sound, but it soon became more muffled, and that meant that the white nutrient fluid was getting bigger and bigger. Yes, at that time they didn't know that machines would be invented someday. In the meantime, the milkmaid, immersed in a kind of meditation, went from one cow to another. When Victoria finished the time was already approaching dinner, the girl ran her hand across her forehead. Lighted spoke of the fact that there was a stuffiness. Tired of it, left gnat surrounded right in front of her eyes. Now and then it was trying to get into her eye. Victoria stepped outside, 
breathing a full sigh. How could she be sick of this job? The girl took off her handkerchief and began to wave her hair away from her face, as if protesting too. Victoria hair to regather it. She gathered the ponytail again and then twisted it closely the bump. Afterward, she questioned the handkerchief to recover his head. At this moment, she felt a look on her face. She turned around. Behind her back stood a young boy. In his hands, he was holding a shovel. He was cleaning the coral and while the cows were grazing in the field. The guy looked at Victoria unashamedly. The girl threw him a scornful glance. Without saying a word to him, she tied her handkerchief and left the barn. How insolent is that? She thought, trying to get out of his sight. The girl reached the office where the dairy staff usually rested. Walking along the corridor, she looked into the administration office. Ah, Victoria. It sounded from the open door. Victoria called her the head of the dairy farm. Come in, please, for a moment be kind. The girl entered the office. Nina and Jenna were here. They were in charge of administration and bookkeeping. Besides them, two men were also present. One of them looked to be about 60 years old, and the other was younger by half two times. Both of them were dressed in white shirts and suits. They behaved quite courteously and gallantly. Victoria realized that they were city people. They gave a pleasant impression of serious and businesslike guests. Here is one of our best milkmaids, Victoria pronounced Jenna. Through the strained smile, it was obvious that she really wanted these guests to like her. Victoria, come closer, said hello to our guests. This is Alex, the owner of the small village, and this is Peter, Alex's assistant, his deputy, as well as some prepared she all, also keeping the corners of her lips pulled apart. Hello, said Victoria, in a thin voice, looking around with short glances. They, however, nodded their heads in greeting and the one who was elderly extended his hand to her. Victoria responded graciously, placing her hand on his palm. The one left a brief kiss on it. Victoria pretended to be pleased. Glancing at his partner, she caught his interested gaze. Well, now that you know each other, do you have any idea who helps us in getting our valuable milk? Jenna laughed. To defuse the situation, Peter turned to him. Alex will take the documents. You will check them and bring them to my desk tomorrow. He said, looking at him. Okay, what do you say? Replied Peter, looking at his father in return. Now let's go and see how we are doing where the process is going. The house clinging administrator slipped between the two men. Please follow me, she was forgetting her guests. Alex came out next to her. Then Nina, Victoria waited for Peter to follow them. But he, instead of going, held out his hand, indicating that he would go after Victoria. The girl smiled slightly and headed for the exit. Just then, Peter slowed her down, and standing he took her by the elbow. You've got a blade of grass snagged here, he said, presenting a spikelet to her eyes. Victoria looked at the spikelet and then at Peter. Something was mesmerizing in his fathomless blue eyes for a moment. The girl felt a strange, unfamiliar feeling inside her. However, remembering the fact that they were not alone here, she hurriedly followed the others. The meeting with the owners of the firm had been a success. They were satisfied. Together with the administration, they also identified some points that require changes, improvements, as well as the introduction of newer technologies in farming. Well, Victoria, tell me. Her mother asked her when the whole family was gathered for dinner. Adriana finished work early. That's why she always cooked dinner. This time there was for cookies potatoes with arches and thin cuts of salted lard. Also on the table were pickled cucumbers and tomatoes. What is there to tell? People like people well-dressed, well-mannered, it is obvious that has good money on the account, answered the daughter, peeling the potato from the skin. Then she broke it into two halves and poured cream over it. The mouth instantly filled with saliva. The father ate in silence and listened to the conversation between wife and daughter. Adriana glanced at her husband. She waited impatiently for him to eat and leave the table. I think they enjoyed it all, Victoria added. Taking a bite of tomato. Did they? Adriana interjected. Her eyes were burning. She was clearly eager for more details. When the father had tasted a delicious dinner, he thanked his wife, kissed her and went to the hall. His back was quite tired from the whole day. 
wanted to take a horizontal position, because today he had to carry out sacks of sawdust, and also to go to the walls. But Doka lay out how it was. Again asked the question mother prepared to dry. She folded her elbows on the table and under the railing with her fist, right cheek. With her gaze she glared at Victoria, as if she wanted her to say what she had been waiting for the most lately. Mom started daughter. Peter and I were just introduced and that's it, she replied. Continuing again with a slice of bread, cream and tomato juice. That's it, Adriana questioned her. Well, yes, what else was there supposed to be? Victoria asked. Well, I don't know, maybe he looked at you or something. Understand, Victoria, this is your chance to get out of the village, to start a new life, a life of prosperity, to be surrounded by beautiful people, Victoria's mother said. In her words you could hear what all mothers wish for their daughters. Well, Victoria led her eyes thoughtfully to the left, and then broke out into a smile. There was one moment, but it meant nothing. The girl quickly dismissed all options. Darling, understand, everything in life is made up of moments, Adriana said. Her eyes were full of love for her daughter. A couple days later, Adriana literally plowed into her home. She looked in all the cabinets in the kitchen rearranging something, then went to the mirror and fixed her hair again banding it under her mom's handkerchief. What are you doing? Asked Victoria, coming out into the kitchen. Today was Saturday, which together with Sunday was a day off for Victoria. She sometimes hummed to them and Adriana. Then she took off her handkerchief and hung it on the back of a chair. Mother, speak. Victoria, who was bursting with curiosity, could not bear it. God himself has arranged all this for us, she said softly, putting her arm around her shoulders. We've been invited to dinner, she blurted out. Almost jumped up on the spot. To lunch, marveled Victoria, who had never received such an invitation. Alex is very much interested in you, or rather in your work. And he would like you yourself to personally speak in front of people and tell about your activities. He was delighted with you, she said, pressing Victor about his activities. Perplexed, Victoria repeated, imagining her coming on stage with great interest and enthusiasm to talk about her daughter's cows. Her face reflected a smile mixed with some chagrin. It was Adriana who repeated. My dear, sat Victoria down in her chair. This is truly your chance to prove yourself, to please them, to open the doors to new happy lives. Adriana held her daughter's hands in her palms. Victoria looked at her mother with eyes full of faith in what she was saying. Her face was filled with light from a body of hope and anticipation for tomorrow. It was no wonder that Victoria's mother wanted Victoria to fit into this family so badly. After all, Peter's father owned all the land that belonged to their village. The morning started out hectic. Adriana had gotten Victoria up early to have time to get ready and be in all her glory. Victoria's father was in the yard, fixing an old car. Adriana was a little nervous and worried that Andrew's slowness would make it to town on horseback. Adriana was stowing Victoria's bow. She looked at her daughter in the mirror. She wore an irresistible burgundy dress with sleeves. It fit her perfectly. It perfectly emphasized her slim waist and slender hips. You look gorgeous. It's a good thing we bought that dress, Adriana said. Victoria smiled back. She liked her outfit too. I'll go ask my father about the car, her mother said and left Victoria's room. The girl looked at herself in the mirror once more and then smiled at her reflection. She had never imagined that she would ever be in the owner's house in the village where they lived. Then, looking closer, she saw in one of the mirrors the reflection of the same young man she had met recently on the farm. It seemed as if she should have been frightened. But instead, she went to the window, and despite the lad's happy face, she closed the door and wrapped the curtains. She wasn't going to respond to signs of attention or support the dubious game of a commoner cleaning the local barn. By the way, this guy had only recently arrived in their village. Victoria didn't even know his name. Well, my daughter, are you ready? Her mother entered the room. She herself was dressed in a light brown colored jacket and skirt. She threw herself a glance from top to bottom, fixed her short haircut, and then turned to Victoria. You're adorable. She walked over to her daughter, looked at her with kind eyes, 
as if she were setting both herself and her up for a happy reunion. Adriana, came her father's voice as they got into the car. The engine hummed more strongly, and the car set off. After an hour's drive, the family was already there. A spacious courtyard surrounded by a fence of iron bars of saints appeared before their eyes. A man in uniform appeared in front of them. He introduced himself to them, and then escorted them into the house. It was huge. Victoria couldn't hide her delight. A maid appeared on the doorstep and helped them undress and make their way to the living room. Andrew Adriana was a little stiff and felt out of place. Everything around them was so exquisite and tastefully furnished. Oh, and here is this most lovely milkmaid, whom all the cows of our farm are crazy about, and therefore so generously gives her delicious fat milk. Pronounced Alex, extending his hand to say hello to the arriving guests. Victoria embarrassedly greeted him back. Alex once again introduced Victoria's family to his wife and the other guests that had also arrived for dinner. Peter looks after Victoria, she shouldn't feel alone. Alex said. No, she's fine, replied Victoria. It's not worth the worry. I'm more than fine, she replied, meeting Peter's eyes. Then she shifted her gaze to his mother, a woman with white skin and an elongated face condescendingly watching. Catching their gaze, Victoria recalled the corners of her lips. This woman was not so benevolent. She was the only one who didn't fully embrace the simplicity of both Victoria herself and her family. So you're saying that the best way to increase the firm's productivity is to introduce some machinery. Alex interjected, penetrating his mouth with a napkin. Of course, answered Andrew. All haymaking and harvesting processes will become much faster and better. He added, looking for support in his wife's eyes. Yes, nodded his head. Alex smiled with a squint in his eyes. I will definitely think about this issue. It's worth paying attention to. He answered, transferring his gaze to Victor and then to his plate. Well, it was dessert time, said Alexa's wife Nicole. Adriana began to smudge herself with the palm of her hand. A little soul, I guess, asked Nicole. And then asked her son to open the door to the balcony. Victoria left the table. She wanted to walk around a bit, a hot lunch and filled conversation, and warmed the atmosphere around them. Peter escorted Victoria into the garden. Show her our greenhouse, she said kindly. Peter approached Victoria and put his elbow out and waited for her to respond to the invitation. The girl took his hand and together they went outside. Victoria felt as if she had entered some other world. The fields, the stalls, and the cows remained somewhere far away. Peter walked slowly, unhurriedly, as if letting Victoria enjoy his company. Finally, they came to a tall flower to where purple roses grew. These roses are very beautiful, Victoria muttered, looking at the voluminous bud and sturdy roses. You and Victoria are as charming and delicate as these roses, said Peter, standing behind the girl. I wish I had met you sooner. Can we switch to you? He asked. Why not? Replied the girl. How is it that your parents, simple laborers, were able to raise such a beautiful child? Continue to pour compliments Peter, trying to turn the head of the young lady. Thank you for the compliment. Embarrassed, Victoria replied. She did not realize that Peter, being older than her by 12 years, used to generalize young beauties, becoming in their eyes a kind of standard and ideal. Peter, please come to the table. The voice of the maid came from the back porch to summon them. The two returned. The rest of the dinner passed in the same good atmosphere. Andrew and Alex were able to discuss some things. Nicole and Adriana chatted about matters of the heart. Back home, Adriana started asking her daughter how it went, what they talked about with Peter, did he like her, how did she like him? Victoria didn't have time to answer her mother's questions. Oh, mom, he's incredibly smart and handsome. I think I'm in love, Victoria muttered. Collapsing on the bed, her mother exhaled with relief. She was glad that her daughter was also attracted to him. So one day Victoria's life changed instantly. The girl was happy. The preparations for the wedding were in full swing. How wonderful that miracles happen, Victoria said, trying on the dress. Adriana had good sewing skills and then she decided to sew the dresses for her daughter herself. 
Will you be the most beautiful bride? Adriana replied. Needles another layer of puffy skirt. A week later the dress was ready. And another week later the wedding day came. Victoria was looking forward to it. Her heart was pounding with happiness. She waited with bated breath for the moment when she could meet her fiancé and become his lawful wife. The church building was filled with music, choruses of women's voices carried along the walls, thrilling everyone to the point of goosebumps. The groom stood at the altar on either side of the aisle. Seated were the guests waiting to see the bride. The doors opened and under her father's hand the bride crossed the threshold. She was in a gorgeous snow-white dress with lace, though it covered her head and hid her face. At such a touching moment, the guests rose from their chairs, seeing off the bride. Walking down the red carpet, Victoria was getting closer to her new life with every step. Finally, she equaled her groom. Peter took her veil with his hands and revealed her face. The girl's bright brown eyes looked up at him. They were full of hope and love. Her lips were slightly emphasized. Victoria trusted him with her life and her destiny completely, without a trace. The Holy Father baptized the young people, then read a prayer, and then went on to the most important thing. He asked the consent of the bride and then of the groom. After answering yes, he sealed the union with a prayer to cross again. Victoria and Peter exchanged rings and kissed each other for the first time. Henceforth, Victoria became a married lady. That's how quickly and beautifully everything changed in her life. The girl moved into Peter's house and became the mistress of the house. In front of Victoria opened the door and welcoming. I offered to come through. Victoria took the first steps and stopped. The house was very beautiful, high ceilings, beautiful chandeliers, gorgeous curtains, large windows. Victoria circled around the house and couldn't be pleased with her happiness. God, how beautiful, how wonderful everything is. I can't believe my happiness. It's unbelievable. God, she repeated, enjoying the beauty of the interior. There's more. My love said Peter, hugging Victoria, kissing her neck. What else could there be? The girl asked, barely containing her curiosity. Peter picked her up on his arm and carried her somewhere in one of the rooms. Here in this spacious bright room was a huge wide bed, and behind it large windows and an open balcony. Victoria hurried out the open door. Her eyes widened. It was a line when she saw the magnificent garden with beautiful vegetation and its trees. Peter, this is something incredible. Thank you, Victoria exclaimed. I run up to him and throw myself on his neck. Are you my princess? Peter said, taking her in his arms and falling on the bed with her. This is all just for you, said he, seeing Victoria's eyes rounding even more. He loved surprising this young girl. And even more he loved the way she admired him and enjoyed everything he did for her. Even though Peter didn't put much effort into it, he had gotten this house from his grandfather. He was waiting for the time to come when Peter would finally marry a decent, decent girl and start a family. Time was running out. Victoria and Peter were getting burned out in the new place. Peter was on the road a lot. Victoria was alone for long periods of time. However, she treated the long business trips of her beloved with understanding. After all, Peter keeps track of companies that are located in several villages. She was proud of her husband, home, and position. There were times when the two of them went on a small trip to neighboring countries, and this gave Victoria great pleasure. The girl was also interested in Peter's affairs in the village. She asked to take her with him, but he never agreed to such a thing, believing that this business is not for women. What will you do there? Smell the dung and socialize with the village commoners. He asked her jokingly. Victoria always laughed in response, because she was lucky. She got out of those places, then go and show everyone who's boss, she said playfully. And then she kissed Victoria goodbye. Peter went to the village. His father had long ago talked to Peter about putting some of the business into his hands so that he would be the sole master of the property. Peter had not agreed at first. He didn't want to take responsibility for the documentation and items of expenditure and income. But his father still insisted. After all, the son is already 30 years old. It's time to learn how to run his own business. So gradually, immersing his son in the working moments, Alex transferred some of the powers into his hands. 
The new car was parked near one of the village houses. Peter made a couple of signals. A girl looked out the window. Seeing Peter, she broke out in a smile. A few minutes later she got into the car with a business-like look and a black folder in her hands. Peter pressed the gas and the two drove off in an unknown direction. Peter had never been noted for his fidelity and did not attach much meaning to his marriage. He loved freedom and independence more than anything else in the world. It never occurred to him that he had to be faithful to anyone. He was only following his father's instructions, which he tried to fulfill. But nevertheless, it could not affect his usual way of life. Even so lovely, pure, immaculate Victoria could not make it while Peter was doing important business in the village Victoria leaned idly in an empty house. At times the girl was just dying of boredom. She didn't know what to occupy herself with or how to entertain herself in such a big house. With every day all comfort and all beauty. What there was in this huge house was beginning to be a source of boredom and despondency. One day, as she walked through the rooms of the house, Victoria reflected on her husband. She wondered if it was good, how he was doing. The longing with each passing minute piled a heavy weight on her shoulders and chest. The girl was already beginning to miss her native places, her friends, her table and tea parties, her walks among the fields, and even those cows. As she pondered and walked aimlessly down the corridor, Victoria didn't notice that she had elbowed the tall lawn where the dwarf guest roses were growing. They had once had a beautifully green cap covered with many peaches, their butts. Now it all lay on the floor, mixed with shards of lawn and skates from the ground. Victoria froze in place, examining what lay chaotically on the floor. Victoria then knelt down and began picking up the earth with her hands. After she brought in new ones, she took a broken rose bush and went out into the garden. She began to plant the roses in new vases. First, she trimmed all the damaged branches, removed the dry leaves and returned the flower to its house. Taking a closer look at it, she concluded that it was a little dull dug up a couple more bushes of other colors in the garden. She also planted them in the neighborhood. These activities were quite fascinating to the girl who spent an hour with the flower. Before she knew it, it was lunchtime. She was informed about it by the maid. When she saw Victoria digging in the ground, she hurried to inform her that she should not have done it. Victoria, she addressed her. You know very well that the earth dries the skin on your hands. All you have to do is ask me and I will do as you wish. The maid said. A woman in her fifties, slightly overweight, but very sweet. Her name was Evelyn. She was very kind and caring. I wanted to do it myself, Victoria replied. I think I did very well, she said with a smile, admiring the work she had done. Yes, Evelyn replied. You've done very well with all those colors. I think you certainly have a talent for it, the maid said. Then Victoria Evelyn went to lunch. Victoria sat alone at the large table. Peter did not make it in time for lunch, citing his business. Victoria lazily hung spoonfuls of soup, still hoping that Peter was about to appear at the door of their house. But time passed, and Peter still did not come. Can I get you anything else? Evelyn asked, seeing the indifferent face of the hostess. No, thank you. It's quite enough, Victoria replied finally putting a spoonful of borscht into her mouth. She felt the loneliness filling her from the inside again. However, victories and from the sights of her favorite pie with nuts, Victoria visibly cheered. The portion of glucose had done its job. The girl's head was filled with thoughts that had never visited her before. She pondered the frosting and the combination of colors and what was the best fitting pot for them. Leaving the table, she headed out to the garden again. After being there for two more hours, she called Evelyn and dictated to her a list of items she needed for her ideas. At that moment, the girl was filled with energy and spirit. Her eyes were burning, she wanted to create. Evelyn, having written down everything she needed, informed the driver. She intended to go to the city to do some shopping. But Victoria herself stopped her on the doorstep. The owner was going to go with her, choosing one of the best outfits that Peter had given her. Victoria got into the car. Evelyn was interested in such an abrupt change in the girl's mood. In a year of working as a maid in their house, this was the first time she had seen Victoria like this. Victoria was very happy to get out into the city 
and do some shopping herself. She took great pleasure in purchasing the pots she had needed last week, as well as fertilizer and various feedings. Along with this, she had purchased a small decor in the form of cotton flowers and the same cotton in their birdies, beige and yellow in color, spending her time doing something she was definitely enjoying. Victoria was beginning to feel a new flavor of life. It's a great feeling when you can create something with your own hands, create, make decisions on your own. Beautiful streets of the city, carved sidewalks, store windows, unusual passersby, Proud girls, young guys, some with frowning faces and some happy, contented. It all amused Victoria terribly and amused her. Evelyn could barely keep up with the girl, holding the bags with the already purchased goods in her hands. She even regretted that she hadn't brought Jack with her, who would have helped her carry the burden without much difficulty for herself. Upon returning home, Victoria, much like the others, was ravenously hungry. She had managed to work up quite an appetite in the few hours she had spent shopping. The cook had already prepared everything for their arrival. Victoria Happy rushed into the dining room, wanting to savor something delicious as soon as possible. She was really happy and full of life. In front of her stood a large table covered with various delicious things. Hot pilaf with chicken was steaming in the plates. Its aroma stirred her stomach in anticipation of a delicious meal and rubbing her hands together, Victoria sat down at the table. The cook lowered a portion of the hot dish into her plate. However, Victoria was in no hurry to begin her meal. She sat waiting in anticipation for Peter, who didn't seem like he was going to be here at all. Victoria waited patiently for him for a few more minutes. The cook and Evelyn, who was standing nearby, silently waited for Peter along with her. Even though they already knew he wasn't worth waiting for, they threw brief glances at Victoria's radiant faces, which was like a child waiting for her husband's imminent appearance. Then Evelyn couldn't stand it and said Victoria she turned to the hostess, going as gently as possible to inform her. Peter will not be here for dinner, she mumbled, pushing up her lower lip. Victoria still kept her smile, as if she hadn't taken her words seriously. Oh, so you're saying Peter isn't coming? Victoria spoke slowly, echoing Evelyn's words. Isn't that right? Do you understand? Evelyn answered, afraid to spoil the young woman's mood. Well, I see, Victoria said, trying not to show her disappointment. Afterward, she picked up her fork and proceeded to the word. What a marvelous pilaf, exclaimed the girl, not paying attention to the resulting tension of the dining room. I'm very glad you liked it. I cooked it according to a special recipe, the cook said. I was a little worried about whether you would like it, but I can see that you are pleased, the cook said. With a calm smile on her face, she knew that Peter would not come. She wanted to please Victoria. The girl didn't answer anything else and silently continued her meal. Then she tasted a little salad and fresh vegetables, and then started somewhere in the back of her mind. She still hoped that Peter would be in time for the final part of the dinner. She couldn't wait to tell him about her endeavors and her new acquisitions and purchases. After drinking the couple mugs of tea and a response of chocolate cake, Victoria never waited for her husband. She felt her soul fill with longing and even self-pity, although these qualities had not been peculiar to her before. After dinner, Victoria thanked the house staff and went to her room. She walked past the non-risky purchases with complete indifference to them. In an instant, she became uninterested in it and went to bed. However, sleep never came. She couldn't find her place. Then she turned on her earphone, picked up a book, tried to fall asleep again, until finally she did not get rid of it at all and fell asleep in the morning from the fatigue that had accumulated during the night. Around 800, Peter showed up. He was a little drunk, but quite in control of himself. When he entered the room, he didn't undress. He flopped down on the bed and fell asleep very quickly. Soon Victoria woke up and saw that Peter was back. She was glad even though he was tired and asleep and she couldn't talk to him, but he was there for her. He looked so vulnerable and sweet as he slept. Victoria watched him in silence. A whetted appetite made Victoria leave the breakfast room. She headed out into the garden again, having Peter back. Even if it was just before morning lifted her spirits before he woke up. 
Victoria wanted to make a couple of the arrangements she had thought of earlier. Her preoccupation with flowers took her off her mind while she picked a few different ones. One pot filled with new ideas and plans that she wanted to put into action. Briefly, the girl walked back into the house. Oh dear. Good morning my joy. Her husband greeted her. He acted as if nothing had happened. Victoria was very happy to see him. She didn't want to spoil the day with an argument. The days they were together. So they were very rare. Peter being here with her was the most important thing. Peter, it's so good to see you. You're finally home. We can spend the day together. I'd like to show you something, Victoria said with intrigue in her voice. Peter arched his eyebrows upward. Oh, darling, not today, groaned the husband. I'm too tired at work. It's a mess. You know that. It took me so long to deal with those employees yesterday. Everybody wants something. Everybody wants something from me. And I only have two hands, Peter said with a laugh. They really need you. They need you to take care of them. You're the one who can make a difference in their lives. Victoria said, seeing in her husband a real hero and a master of his work. Victoria decided not to be upset about Peter's rejection of her proposal. She treated the circumstances with understanding. All right, what do you say? Do you really need to rest? You work a lot, socialize with people. You get tired, the girl said. But I can do something for you. Victoria spoke, going around Peter behind his back on his shoulders. He was forcing this pleasure. How strong are your hands? God, how pleasantly in bliss Peter spoke. This is what I've been missing all this time, said Peter, closing his eyes at the pleasant relaxation in his body. Victoria laughed a little at the neck of her husband's shoulders, then slid down his chest to Peter's warm hands. She took his hand and pulled him from behind the desk, dragging him behind her into the room. The doors closed tightly, leaving no pike, no stranger's eye could peek or see what was going on behind the walls of that room. And in the meantime the whole space was filled with passion and love. In the room hovered, gentle kisses and hot hugs. When Victoria decided to fold Peter's pants and jacket neatly, she accidentally discovered money bills that were lying haphazardly in the pockets of his pants. Victoria frowned her eyebrows were lost in speculation as to where such a large amount of money had come from. Crumpled carelessly folded lay in the pockets. Among the bills, a business card belonging to one of the restaurants in the city presented itself to Victoria's gaze. The girl thought that since her husband socializes with different people, their meetings take place under different circumstances. It was quite possible that a very necessary meeting was taking place in this restaurant. Victoria trusted her husband completely. Therefore, she had no doubts about his fidelity. Victoria had a nice house, her own garden, a rich husband's home cook. What more could she want? Everything suited the girl. And now, when Victoria found out that she was carrying Peter's child under her heart, her life took on new colors. Especially Victoria's situation was not recognized at once. It started with a constant and seemingly endless desire to sleep. Victoria after breakfast would go to the garden, where she would make compositions at a special table. And after about an hour, she was ready to go to bed right on her desk. Returning to the house, Victoria went into her room, had time to wash her hands, and immediately fell off her feet. After a week of similar attacks, Evelyn was concerned about her condition, that she was spending so much time in bed. Called a doctor. After examining the girl, the doctor concluded that Victoria is completely healthy. To our great happiness, Victoria is completely fine, the doctor said. I address both Victoria and Evelyn at once. As with her future baby, however, a smile appeared on his face and his eyes squinted. At that moment, he looked like a cat that had just discovered something very interesting. Evelyn gasped, her eyes couldn't. Victoria tried to comprehend what had just been said. Congratulations, said the doctor. That'll be $100, he summarized. Walking out into the hallway, Evelyn pressed her palms to her chest. She wanted to kiss Victoria immediately, to hug her and hold her clothes. But she needed to see the doctor off. I'll be right there. The woman said and ran out after him. Well, stretched Evelyn, returning to Victoria's room. How beautiful it is. My darling, let me give you a hug. She said, 
Holding out her arms to the lady of the house, she gladly accepted. Let's cook these congratulations. Tonight is a delicious dinner. I'll make a surprise for Peter. Joyfully said Victoria, filled with light. However, no one canceled her sleepy state, and she yawned widely with great pleasure. At 6 p.m. the table was set, on which flaunted incredibly exquisite dishes. With the gorgeous Russian Victoria, I wanted to make a feast. She arranged the candles herself and lit them. She also asked the maid and Jack to hang her flower arrangements above the table. Jack had to work hard and sweat a lot before he managed to do it. The clock struck 18 o'clock sharp. Victoria was sitting at the table waiting for Peter. Evelyn was with her. She was standing at the window waiting for Peter to appear. It should be here soon, Evelyn said, reassuring Victoria. And in a minute Peter appeared on the doorstep. He was a little tired. As usual, he threw off his outer garments and threw his hat on a chair. Then he walked into the living room. The lighted candles and Victoria in her beautiful dress caught his eye and made him wonder what was going on. I don't know, he said, scrutinizing those present, and especially Victoria. Her eyes glittered. She could barely contain herself from jumping for joy. You said Peter excitedly. What happened? He repeated. Question grab her hands. We're having a baby. Victoria finally blurted out. Looking Peter straight in the eyes, he stood still for a while. But a few seconds later, when he realized what he had heard, his face changed, stupor replaced by surprise. And then his laughter erupted. Peter lifted Victor in his arms and surrounded him. He was truly delighted to hear the news. You will bear me a son strong and strong just like I said Peter. You could see in his eyes that he could already see his future in ten years. Victoria clung to him. She didn't care if it was a boy or a girl. She would love them both. After the happy news, life went on as usual. Peter was also engaged in the development of the village, increasing the profits of the dairy farm. Victoria spent all her free time in the garden, tending to the plants. She was much interested in them, reading about them. She conducted various experiments with grafting new teenagers and also tried to exhibit her compositions in flower stores. But this occupation was rather just a hobby and passion, rather than a desire to get some income. Victoria was happy when her compositions were taken apart on the same day, and when one of the buyers was interested in her business card. Gradually Victoria had the first two regular customers who decorated her flowers, their restaurants. However, despite Victoria's great employment, her new hobby, she still lacked the attention of Peter. Her husband, strangely enough, began to be delayed more often on various errands. He often did not spend the night at home, and almost every weekend he came home drunk. When he came home, he would approach Victoria and lay his palm on her stomach. You'll be the strongest, the most cunning. Just like your father said Peter would be. Then he'd fall on his side and fall asleep. Victoria didn't know if there was anything she could do about it. She still thought that Peter was working too hard and stressed out, so she tried to calm herself down with alcohol. A few months later, a long-awaited baby was born on the due date. The labor was not the easiest. Evelyn was worried about Victoria's well-being. She was so fragile so young, but she had to experience terrible agony. Finally, when it was over, the doctor handed the baby to Evelyn. There you have a beautiful baby girl, he announced. Evelyn was happy that everything was over and now their house would be filled with children's laughter. Victoria, you are a great girl, you did it, you did it well, the woman said, handing the baby to the mother. My little girl, my little girl, she whispered wet and exhausted. Victoria, her hands were covered with a small shiver. She kissed her daughter's warm forehead. The baby nestled against her chest. At that moment, Peter appeared in the room. He looked at his wife with big round eyes. Evelyn, assuming what would be obediently lowered her eyes. Peter, whose pupils burned black and against the icy background, looked hopefully at Victoria. The woman was smiling. Her face was so sweet and gentle, even though she was in terrible pain. But now Peter was only interested in one thing. Tell me, tell me, is it a boy? Peter said. His face was full of tension. He didn't want to hear anything but one thing. We had a daughter. Victoria said. You will be a father to a beautiful daughter. 
The woman said, looking for understanding and love in his eyes. But instead, she found deep disappointment in his eyes. Peter reached out and opened the corner of the blanket. He saw the sleeping baby cuddled against her mother's chest. Peter's face darkened. He couldn't hide his indignation. He could not lie or pretend that he was glad to see his daughter. Getting out of bed, Peter left the room. Victoria looked after him, tears welling up in her eyes. She was left in complete incomprehension. Is it possible to do this to them? Will he come to his senses and everything will be back to normal? Evelyn said, trying to calm Victoria. Nothing, daughter, nothing. Men are mostly selfish. That's why they have to struggle in this world, she added. Evelyn's heart clenched. In that moment, she felt sorry for Victoria and the way Peter had treated her. But weeks and months went by. Victoria had fully recovered the baby, named Violetta, was growing up to be a healthy and active child. Victoria couldn't get enough of her. She loved her without memory. She as a true mother wished her all the best in this life, and even Peter's rejection and some coldness towards her daughter could not spoil Victoria's worldview after the birth of her daughter. Peter had changed a lot. He was away from home more often, and when he was, he was rather cold and indifferent. There was something very different about him. He became more withdrawn, moody, and angry. His interests seemed to have shifted to making big profits. Although Victoria knew that the firm would not be able to keep up with the changing and accelerating sales market without the introduction of new technologies. But what about Victoria and her garden? After four years, she was able to find the zest for her business that people liked best and were willing to pay for her labor and for filling the world with beauty. Now that Victoria had both the daughter she loved and an occupation that inspired her, she felt strong and fulfilled. Peter's coldness and indifference no longer tormented her with such force as it would have before. Yes, Victoria had gotten what she had dreamed of. Security, prosperity, and a stable future. She had achieved all of those things. But except for one thing, except for mutual and true love. Unfortunately, with each passing day, she watched Peter grow more glorious, more angry, and hungrier for more money. When Violet turned five, she began to notice that Peter was no longer trying to hide his affairs on the side. He might well have come in with the scent of a woman's perfume or with lipstick on his shirt. At first she tried to talk to her husband, but all her attempts went nowhere. He only got angry, irritated and said that it was none of her business and that she was making things up for herself. Once Peter reproached Victoria that she bore him a daughter instead of a son. A woman, if she loves, she bears him a son strong strong so that he can carry on his work. And what can you do? Can you? He asked Victoria with blood in his face, in great displeasure. There it is all your love. Are you incapable of giving me a son? What is there to talk to you about? He declared. After Victoria once again started a conversation about their relationship. And really, Victoria had nothing to answer to this question. After a difficult childbirth, she could no longer have children much less give Peter a son. As the years went by Victoria and Peter maintained their relationship as husband and wife. After all, Peter had made a commitment to be responsible for Victoria's life, as well as providing for her. One day Victoria was left behind in the house. One Violetta together with Evelyn were walking in the garden, and with their hand through the window, Victoria smiled at them and sent her daughter an air kiss. The girl especially liked to play such games. She got just incredible happiness and a feeling of joy from it. Victoria loved to see how her daughter was doing well in this world. Right now she was thanking God that she was healthy and cheerful. Her observations were interrupted by a phone call that came from Peter's office. Her husband almost always locked himself in it when he was home. He said he needed to gather his thoughts and get his affairs in order. Usually the door to the study was always locked because little Violetta could enter without asking and do something wrong. This time it was unlocked and even slightly open. Victoria pushed the door open with her hand and stepped inside. The window was also open, but it was also creating a draft. The phone calls stopped. For the first time in a long time, Victoria found herself interested here. She began to look around curiously. 
Early this morning, through her sleep, she had heard Peter hurrying as he left. Apparently he had forgotten to lock up properly. There were some papers on the table. Victoria picked up one of them. It described the village with all the houses in it, including the farm, the church and a small bread and bakery. Victoria returned the paper to the table. On another sheet, to Victoria's great bewilderment, a card debt for a large sum was outlined, along with a date by which Peter had to pay it. Victoria felt a chill run down her spine. The documents were lying on something hard. The woman picked up the entire stack and saw a couple of small keys. Apparently, Peter had been out of it or in too much of a hurry. Since she had forgotten about them here in Treed, Victoria could no longer stop herself, especially since her husband never told her about his business. She left the key in the desk drawer. The lock opened easily. There were various folders inside as well. Victoria knew it was wrong to rummage through someone else's desk, but curiosity took over. She opened one folder. Then the other her eyes quickly read the lines. Her mouth opened. What she read came as a shock. The documents were from as far back as seven years ago. Victoria was 16 at the time, and it was at that time that her father had made a pact with Peter that when Victoria came of age, she would be required to marry Peter. This alliance was removed by Andrew from Victoria, a commitment to move out of the village. Victoria looked away from the papers to digest what she had read. Based on Andrew's papers, his family was going to be stripped of their home, evicted to the streets. Andrew had tried to negotiate with Peter's father with Alex to allow them to live in the house at least until Victoria turned 18. Then they would marry her off and provide her with a place to live. That's when it occurred to Alex that Andrew could buy his home if he paid a sum much less than the value of the debt. However, at the same time, he would have to give his own daughter in marriage to his son. The calculated made Victoria flustered. She finally realized that Peter had never loved her. He was only doing his father's bidding. From revealing the secret that fell on Victoria like an icy rain, the woman's breath caught. She reread the document again and again. Don't believe her eyes, so everything was known in advance. Everything was planned, Victoria uttered in a half whisper. At that moment a child's laughter sounded. It brought Victoria to her senses. She immediately began to quickly put the documents into a folder and then into a drawer. Afterward, a man's voice was heard. It was Peter the blood pulsing in the woman's temples. She grabbed the key, but it fell to the floor. Shit, whispered Victoria, trying to retrieve it from under the table. The footsteps were getting closer. What are you doing here? Peter asked sternly. Victoria, did you just close the window? She turned around to face her husband. Ah, Peter. Hello. How unexpectedly Victoria said, putting on the mask of the greeting fool. I told you not to let anyone in here without my permission. Peter insisted. Victoria pretended that she was going to explain everything. Yeah, yeah, sure. But you left the door unlocked. A strong wind blew through the open door, and it turned out to be all from the window that was left open. Victoria spoke easily and casually. Then she walked up to Peter and kissed him on the cheek. She was about to leave, but Peter held her tightly against him. Victoria was completely bewildered, as she had been the other times Peter had been overcome by a rush of passion. Victoria felt his hot hands on her back, he nestled against her neck. Victoria was completely bewildered. I have to go, I promised my daughter something, she said, trying to stop Peter. But he, like an unbridled beast, wouldn't let her go from his strong embrace. Very lightly he sat Victoria down on the table, shifting her hips. Victoria searched her mind for ways to retreat, his hands roaming over her body, trying to reach her soft skin. The woman had no choice but to drop the phone to the floor. The one with a dribble went flying apart. To make matters worse, there was a glass of water on the table, which was also knocked over by the water, spreading across the table to the tune of documents. Ah, sorry. Victoria began to apologize. Released from Peter's embrace, I'll help clean up, she offered. But her husband stopped her. Don't touch anything, he said sharply. Victoria froze in place. I take everything here myself, he added, pulling on his jacket. Victoria hurriedly left the office, entering her room. She tried to calm herself down. 
Her head was full of different thoughts. On the elevator from the water, she drank a whole glass in a gulp. Violetta ran into the room. Mommy, mommy, look what I have. She showing the doll, a weave made of grass. What beauty! exclaimed Victoria, looking at this creation. Did you make it yourself? she asked. Daughter. Yes, the girl boasted. Then, taking the doll in her hands, ran out the door again. It was getting close to dinner time. This was indicated by the clock, which Victoria always set to 12, so that she wouldn't miss it while working. All three of them were sitting at the table. The cook was pouring hot, flavorful soup. As always, the meal passed in complete silence. Now, when Peter was sitting at the table, he had the exact opposite personality than before in the office. After finishing his meal, he thanked the cook, and after saying goodbye to the family, returned to his office mom. Why is dad so sad? He's tired. Asked Violetta, who clearly lacked communication with her father. Yes, dear. When you have a lot of responsibility for others, but yourself there is too little time, Victoria answered. She wanted her daughter to have good memories of her father. One day Victoria asked to go to the village with Peter. She wanted to see how things were going there. Unfortunately, Victoria's parents passed away early. She had no opportunity to visit them. But nevertheless, there were some friends she knew in the village, with whom she would have loved to go for a walk. Violetta would be out in the fresh air, running on the grass, because she had gotten used to real nature in the city. Victoria said, I'll get my husband on my side. All right, Peter agreed. He didn't want to think about it for a long time, so it was easier to take them with him. The weather was quite pleasant. The day was sunny with no sunshine, but at the same time not hot. The car stopped near the village administration building Victoria refused to go in with Peter, saying that she was taking a walk with her daughter. Evelyn also went along with them. She took with her a basket with tea, cookies, and a blanket. They also took along some toys for Violet. The local children that were playing ball in the green meadow interested the girl. Asking her mother's permission, she went to meet them. The children gladly accepted her into their game. Violetta turned out to be very fast and athletic. She easily overtook the local boys. One of them even pushed her in the side. He fell down and rolled on the grass, imitating an incredible fall. The children laughed and continued to play. Victoria Evelyn watched the children sitting on a bench in the shade. Evelyn pulled out a cookie and offered it to Victoria. The woman did not refuse. Violetta, seeing that the adults had started their meal without her, was beside them in an instant. The other children looked at the newcomers with interest. Take a package and share it with the kids, Victoria suggested to her. Violetta happily went to treat the children. While Violetta was having fun with the kids, Victoria decided to walk around the familiar places. Nothing had changed here in a few years. Everything was exactly the same as nine years ago. Green meadows, a river in the distance, luxurious white birch trees. In some places there were groves of small cheerful houses where people still lived. The local cows and horses that grazed in the field reminded her of her former life. There is a price to pay for everything, Victoria thought as she walked down the path. She didn't feel sorry for herself or lament her fate. She was well aware that her life, as it was, suited her perfectly, even if things didn't work out with Peter. So what? To each his own. That's what she thought. Would you like a ride? A man's voice sounded from somewhere to the right. Victoria paused. In front of her stood a guy about 28 years old, tall, tanned. The white shirt was just right for him, giving away his distinct physique. Honestly, I haven't done this in a long time. Victoria said, who really forgot the last time she had ridden a horse. But then it's worth updating your skills, the boy said, insisting on his suggestion. Victoria looked at him thoughtfully. Hearing it from the mouth of a handsome guy was so tempting that Victoria, after some thought, agreed. The guy helped her up onto the horse, then gave her a few parting words. Force the shadows. Don't fidget, don't yell and don't chase the horse while he muttered. The whole instruction made Victoria feel the importance of the action. The boy slapped the horse's thigh and the horse lurched forward. Victoria's brown skirt stood swaying, and then harder. 
The horse's stride shifted to a sprint. The woman held tightly to the rope, then grabbed onto the horse's manes. The wind pondered her face and forced her to spare her eyes. For a moment, Victoria felt fear for her safety. The horse was rushing forward and had no intention of stopping. The woman was beginning to panic in order to stay on top of the horse. Victoria had to lean her torso forward to be in a closer position to the animal. She turned back around behind her riding the horse was the same stranger who had offered her a ride. With each passing second he grew closer. Finally, in one leap he was behind her horse. Taking the rope in his hand, he quickly subdued the animal. They went back together. The horse walked calmly and obediently along the path. Thank you, Victoria said. I was a bit hasty when I agreed to ride, the woman admitted. The stranger stopped the horse, but did not hurry down to the ground. Victoria could feel the warmth of his legs through her dress. It's time for me to go back. My daughter is waiting for me, Victoria said, waiting for the boy to come down first. The guy, strange as a horse, and afterward helped Victoria down. My name is Sam, he said, extending his hand. Victoria, the woman replied, looking at his hand a little slower. She placed her hand on his. Sam leaned in slightly and touched her hand with his lips. Victoria, I felt awkward. I have to go. Thank you for the walk, the woman said and hurried away from her new acquaintance. He followed her with a glance. Victoria felt a strange feeling inside her. Walking a little forward, she turned around. The strong, sturdy young man very deftly jumped on the horse, and taking the second horse, rode off on his own. Mother, where have you been? I'm hungry. Violetta spoke in a ringing voice. The little girl had already met everyone. She's very sociable, Evelyn remarked, approaching Victoria. Where did you go? She asked, looking at her in both neck, strands, and face. I decided to go for a little walk, and then I realized that I had already gone very far away, so I was in a hurry to get back to you. Victoria lied. You got here just in time. It was lunchtime, Evelyn said, looking at her watch. Ten minutes later everyone was in the dining room of the administration building. The table was set modestly, but quite tasty. Violetta wrinkled his nose and was cranky, not wanting to eat the soup. Peter was as serious as ever. He quickly finished the soup and moved on to the second one. Victoria looked at her husband, remembering Sam. He was much younger than Peter. His face was bright and full of life. He seemed kind and noble. What could not be said of the perpetually scowling and angry Peter? After lunch, the whole family, including Evelyn, moved back home. Victoria was glad that she had gotten out to her hometown. Even if there were no relatives left here, then came the fall. Gray, dreary days stretched out in an endlessly long succession. Victoria finished the garden and had already moved all her plants to the spacious warm loggia. The woman was relaxing in an armchair reading a book. Suddenly Peter burst in. He was irritated and angry, casting a cold look in his icy eyes. He made his way to the window, then abruptly turned around and, rubbing his chin, suddenly asked you entered my office without my knowledge. He was clearly agitated. I have no need to go in there, Victoria replied in a calm tone, continuing to read. Where is your daughter? He asked. Breathing heavily Violetta with Evelyn, they are strolling in the garden. What's wrong? Are you worried about something? Victoria decided to ask, knowing in advance that Peter would not go into details. Did someone take my money? Peter said, looking straight into Victoria's eyes. The money, but it's in the safe, Victoria reminded him. Peter himself had once said that a safe was an essential part of any office. Peter averted his eyes and looked out of the window. Violetta, together with her they were indeed walking under the umbrella and were already on their way to the house. Without saying anything more, Peter returned to his study. The door was not fully closed so Victoria was able to see Peter pulling paper bills out of his wallet. He counted them, then tossed them on the desk and looked in his wallet again. Victoria remembered the card debt she'd learned about from the papers on his desk. The woman had said nothing about it to Peter. However, she herself began to guess that her husband's affairs had become quite bad. The following month Victoria asked Peter to go to the village again. 
She wanted to ask some of the villagers secretly from him about how things were going on the farm, the bread, the bakery, and the village in general. However, this time Peter answered with a firm refusal. It wasn't surprising, really. It only further confirmed her hunches. Thirty minutes after her husband's departure, Victoria called a cab and drove off to the village by herself, already on the approach to the village. She recognized Peter's car, which was parked outside the house where her childhood friend lived. Victoria asked the driver to slow down, and he obediently stopped. Peter soon emerged from the house. He walked briskly toward the car. A minute later, a young woman about Victoria's age appeared on the porch. It was Maria. She ran after Peter, carrying a package in her hands. Handing it over, she spooned her lips into Peter's. Victoria watched with bated breath. After the engine hummed, and Peter drove further to the administration building, Victoria ordered the driver, go ahead. After 20 meters, the car turned left. Victoria slipped the driver a few more bills, paying him for waiting. The woman got out of the car and headed for Maria's house. She was determined. She was tired of living in guesswork and ignorance about what the future held for their family and what Peter was going to make of the village. A knock sounded on the wooden door. Maria appeared on the threshold. She looked at Victorious. Something happened inside her that she let her into the house with ease. Come in, don't be shy, she said. Perhaps Maria had decided that Victoria had arrived with Peter. Maybe something else had influenced her behavior. The woman entered the house, not knowing where to start the conversation. How long has it been since we've seen each other? Victoria began to take a seat in the kitchen. She was dressed in a beautiful long dress and an equally long coat. A handkerchief with large pink flowers lay neatly around her neck and chest. She looked much more noble and beautiful than Maria herself. Victoria had time to notice the slanted glances in her direction. Why have you come? Asked the teapot. So I thought I'd visit, see how you're doing. Yes, to ask how things are going in the village. Victoria blurted out. I'll give it to you straight. What's there to tell? Maria started with the question. Then, after waiting for the water to boil, she made tea. The jet of steep boiling water filled with a soft sound behind Warnig. Peter and I have been together for a long time. Is that what you wanted to know? Maria declared, running up mud with tea, friend. Victoria silently lowered her eyes. She guessed about her husband's cheating. But it's one thing to guess, and another to hear it when you are told it head on. Tell me please, how are things on the farm and in the village in general? I found the strength to ask Victoria. Afterwards, she took a sip of the hot liquid, rich flavored tea. It was comforting to know that the farm and the bakery and the village as a whole would not be around anytime soon, Maria said. Shaking her head to the side, apparently from excessive tension and excitement. What do you mean, there won't be? Victoria interrogated. The woman had to admit that this question worried her more than anything else. After all, her future and her daughter's future depended on it. I'm madly in love with Peter, Maria said. He is for me the best person in the world, no matter what anyone thinks of him. There was a pause. Victoria could only envy Maria's love for her husband. He's a very good man, except that he'd gone rogue. Connecting with the cards, she pressed her lips together. Victoria felt the excitement building up. A large debt had accrued. There was no way Peter could pay it off, though he was really hoping to. He'd been holding out. Now he was given a condition and interest. A year later, the amount has multiplied. It was impossible to close it on his own. Maria sighed. But I'll still be with him until the end. He is all I have, she said, looking at Victoria with eyes seeking sympathy and understanding. Victoria couldn't give her that. She didn't feel an ounce of pity for Peter, who had completely thoughtlessly disposed of what he had gotten with the ease of his father's hand. Are you saying that Peter will have to give the village to someone to whom he owes a debt? Victoria clarified. Unfortunately, yes. He's not capable of handling it on his own, Maria added. Victoria had nothing more to say to Maria. The woman asked her not to tell Peter about their conversation. Saying goodbye, she left the house. Turning the corner, she headed toward the river. Here, as usual, there were almost no people. The locals had long been accustomed to the views here. 
therefore, they were not particularly fond of such walks. By fate, he was here too. Seeing a familiar face, the guy headed towards her. I didn't expect you to be here again, Sam said. Victoria fixed her handkerchief. The wind rubbed her hair compulsively. You must be cold, he said, moving closer to Victoria. The woman took a step back. I should be going by now, she said, and then quickly headed toward a car about 20 meters away from the cab. Victoria noticed Peter walking straight toward her. His head was, so he couldn't see her. The woman didn't want him to know she was here. So she went into the first building she could find. Closing the door behind her, she could watch Peter through a small gap in the boards. The man walked past Victoria and looked around. The building turned out to be a hay barn. It was quite large and resembled a wide, long hallway. Victoria decided to walk through it so as to be less likely to be seen by passersby. Victoria had reached the halfway point when she heard a noise ahead of her. Someone was pulling the door open and stepping inside. What ridiculous position have I found myself in? Victoria thought, searching with her eyes for a place to hide. Stepping behind a row of huge rolls against the walls, the woman lurked. The footsteps were getting closer. Victoria prayed that no one would see her. What are you doing here? A question sounded behind her back. Victoria turned around and found the same Sam in front of her. He was staring down at her, brazenly and without any shyness. Victoria decided not to answer him. She took a step forward, but immediately stopped. As the guy blocked her way with his hand, she involuntarily took his palm in her hands. The hand was so hot that the woman immediately grabbed the heat. I was just looking, Victoria started to say, but when she met Sam's eyes, she was at a loss for words. He was so damn good looking, young, confident with a slight cockiness in his eyes, he stared at her. Then his gaze dropped to her lips, making her feel ashamed of her foolish position. Victoria tried to move away to make way for herself. She had to push the so assertive guy, but just as she did so, she immediately found herself grabbed by his wrist. Victoria fell down and with Sam lying on top of her, the woman started to climb up. Her long coat and also her dress prevented her from doing so. Over the top of her coat, a hay shawl flew down from her head. Victoria tried to free her hands, but Sam a guy without principles and any complexes only amused himself with her attempts. Victoria felt herself being drawn into an absolutely childish game, filled with heat from inside. She was about to scream when suddenly she heard the sound of the barn door opening again. Victoria froze. She couldn't let anyone see her in here, not even with a country boy. As the woman listened to the rustles that gradually moved farther and farther away from the barn, Sam slowly but surely pulled her closer and closer to him. Then in an instant Victoria found herself already under Sam's weight. Without thinking, he pressed his lips to hers. The kiss from surrounded the woman's head and completely disarmed her. She was already unable to control herself as she gave in to passion. Victoria had lost her mind. Recovering from what she'd done, Victoria quickly made her way home. Sam didn't even have time to ask her anything. The woman threw on a handkerchief and ran out of the barn. A couple minutes later she was already in the car that was taking her to the city. Her head snapped up, unrelated thoughts. Victoria had in no way expected of herself that she was capable of succumbing to unbridled temptation in her twenties. The woman tried to forget what she had done. She promised herself not to come to the village again. Mommy, I missed you. Seven-year-old Violetta ran up to Victoria. I had to leave on business. Victoria replied, leaning over and hugging her daughter. Oh, what's that flew by girl? In her hands she held a frozen dried flower that she had pulled from her mother's hair. Victoria laughed. It must have caught on while I was in the garden. Victoria composed herself. Are we going to go to the garden today? The daughter asked again. Well, after lunch, I think so, Victoria answered, leading Violet by the hand to her room. In the evening Victoria lay in bed. She was remembering what had happened. She was terribly ashamed of her extreme intemperance. This is crazy, she said aloud. Trying to distract herself, Victoria started reading a book, but her body still held Sam's touch. Once again, she vowed to herself to never ever again. She spoke out loud. 
At that moment there was a knock in her room and the door opened. It was Peter, are you still awake? He asked, entering quietly. Victoria was a little worried. She felt like she was showing that she had just cheated on her husband. I decided to read a little, Victoria answered, and the corners of her lips turned upwards. I was a little rough on you last night. I'm sorry, he said. Victoria didn't understand why all this speech. Peter hadn't been very gentle in his remarks before. It's all right, it's all right. Victoria said, watching Peter walk toward her desk. Are you looking for something? Victoria asked. Peter's behavior made her suspicious. Do you still wear necklaces? What did I give you? Peter asked, running his fingers across the table. Then he headed towards the bed and sat on the edge of her necklace. Victoria interjected. She had plenty of jewelry that she wore according to her mood. But of course, found what? Again she asked. Nothing, answered Peter, placing his hand on his wife's cheek. Victoria waited for him to continue. She didn't understand what he was getting at, though she was beginning to guess. I just like seeing you beautiful, he said. Victoria stared at him, pretending as if she didn't know about his affair with the other woman. Peter leaned over and kissed Victoria's shoulder. Then his lips began to shower kisses on her neck and chin. I'm tired. I wish I could go to sleep earlier, Victoria said. Peter danced back a little and smiled softly. Good night, he said and left the room. Victoria sighed a full breath. It was now that she caught herself thinking that Peter had become a complete stranger to her. She had felt it before, but now the realization came especially vividly. Making sure that Peter had definitely gone to his room, Victoria got out of bed and quietly locked the door. Afterward, she knelt down and crawled under the bed. There, lying on her stomach, she fingered the catch and stuck her hand out. After a few seconds, she pulled out a chest. It was quite weighty. The woman opened it. It contained various pieces of jewelry, rings, earrings, including a necklace. Victoria also put the money she received from the sales of the composition here. After checking that everything was in place, Victoria closed the chest, turned the wheel to the desired misfire, and then tucked it under the floor, putting it back in place. The woman lowered herself onto the bed. Yes, Victoria had to admit that she was proving to be a less than loving wife who was willing to follow her husband to the end. Victoria's first thought was for her daughter's future. After learning about her husband's gambling debt, she decided to save for emergencies on her own. Peter did not tell her anything often and sat in his office for long periods of time, so over time she lost all trust in him. But since her flower business was not yet bringing in a steady income, she was forced to, to save and put away what she had gained. I need you today, Peter declared. Early in the morning during breakfast, Victoria was extremely surprised by his proposal. May I ask what for? Victoria asked. Being in high spirits, you're my wife, and so you will act as my support. When I talked to the phones, mumbled Peter, sending the sandwich into his mouth. Victoria almost choked on it, barely restraining herself from coughing. She carried the mug with tea to her mouth. And what issue will be raised for discussion? Again asked his wife, wanting to learn more about the upcoming trip. You know everything on the spot, Peter replied. Strong coffee. Afterwards he took out a cigarette and lit it. Peter, we agreed that you would not smoke at the table, Victoria said. Peter puffed hard and let out a big club. Smoke didn't ruin my morning, darling. Peter answered her without blinking an eye. Victoria, taking a mug of tea, returned to her room. Such boorish behavior of her husband was pissing her off beyond belief. But she was. Couldn't do anything about it, to start fighting someone who was knowingly stronger than her. She considered it empty foolishness. By 11 o'clock, the car pulled up to the village administration building. Peter entered the office and began to look for something among the papers. When she asked him what he was looking for, Peter said nothing. Then, finally finding some documents, he went to the farm. Victoria went with him. On the way the woman prayed that she would not be caught by Sam. Outside the office, some of the farm workers had gathered. They all wanted to ask their questions. Victoria was concerned that they were not friendly. Seeing Victoria's Peter, people in gray and dirty clothes turned towards them. When will we get our paychecks? Asked one of the women. 
She was large with an apron over her jacket. It was obvious that she was missing a couple of teeth. Victoria felt uneasy. Where's our money? It sounded from somewhere to the right. Victoria turned her head and saw a familiar face. It was Grandma Nura, who had been working as a milkmaid on the farm for a long time. The thieves shouted from the crowd. Are you living off us? Angry poked a young girl Victoria with her finger, slammed her saliva down. Her throat was dry. She's never been in an argument like this before. That's why I came to you with my wife, pronounced Peter, not paying any attention to the discontent before wearing this pillar. Victoria looked around at the angry faces with sharp stares raining down on her. Women and men looked at what once lived with them and worked in this dairy and now stands all dressed up in expensive clothes. While they are forced to lead a miserable life, collecting pennies and economizing on every piece of bread. Are you saying that you want a salary? Interrogated Peter, turning to the young girl that stood closest to him. Yes, Peter. Everyone wants to be paid for his labor, she replied, not afraid to look the dairy owner in the eye. Well, I heard you. Let's see how well you work, Peter said with a slee smile. He squinted at the girl, stopping his gaze. What are your duties? He asked. You, lifting her chin with two fingers of your right hand? I make the cream, the girl replied. Very good. Bring it, don't sit there, we'll taste it. How well do you do your job? Sonny said Peter, without removing from his face an unkind smile. The girl hurriedly went into the combine. After came out with a mug, in which fresh cream was poured to half, Victoria watched with bated breath. The mill worker held out the mug of cream to Peter. Everyone around them was silent, not understanding what was happening. Peter brought it to his lips and guzzled a little. It's impossible to drink, it's disgusting. Exclaimed he completely discouraged the girl and giving her the mug back. Excuse me, Peter, but the cream is fresh today. She said, confident in her product. Try it again. She handed him the mug a second time. Peter took it in his hands, but instead of taking a second drink, he raised the mug above the girl's head and tilted it. A white mass immediately poured out over her head. Victoria was shocked. She covered her mouth with the palm of her hand. She felt sorry for the girl, but she couldn't help it. I'm waiting for an apology, Peter said, keeping his eyes on the girl. Peter tried to stop him. Victoria, what kind of salary can we talk about when your product does not meet the standard quality? Peter continued to press. Then he looked up at the others. Did anyone else have any questions? Why haven't any of you been paid for your paltry labor? He asked the question. Everyone was silent. People were afraid of losing what little they had left. Then Peter went to the dairy building. Victoria took out a handkerchief and held it out to the girl, but the girl did not accept her help. Looking at Victoria with an embittered look, she took her hand and wiped the cream from her head with the sleeve of her coat. Victoria remained silent. She realized that this girl was going through a very difficult time right now. So when Victoria turned to walk to the farm building, she faced Sam. He was standing in the aisle, not giving any sign. She walked past him, wiping her sleeve with her handkerchief. Peter, why are you doing this to them? Victoria asked him as she entered the accounting office. There was no one here. Peter had fired the bookkeeper long ago, so he did all the paperwork himself. With whom? Peter asked. As if nothing had ever happened with people. They work for you. You can't do that. Victoria tried to reason with him. Peter continued to collect the documents, making sure they were filled out correctly. Peter. Victoria took his hand. What's going on? She dared to ask him. But Peter paid no attention to her. Then Victoria shook his hand harder. Peter. She called out to him again. Peter stopped, then forcefully pushed Victoria to the side. Don't we ever dare tell me how you can. How you can't, he said clearly, glittering with the wild eyes of a man who seemed to be going mad. More so with every passing hour. Victoria adjusted her coat and handkerchief, which nearly flew to the floor. She looked out the window. There were still people standing in the street. Their moods had only gotten worse. Victoria wanted to run out into the street and go home, but frankly, she was afraid of being among the disgruntled crowd. Peter, it's true. Victoria began. Is it true that you're selling the village to pay your card debt? 
she asked at last. True, indifferently, he replied. And our house he is safe. You didn't stop, Victoria. The house belongs to you. So don't worry, answered Peter, putting all the necessary sheets in one folder. So you repaid the debt with the money from the sale from the village. Victoria did not stop, fearing for the safety of the house. Peter answered nothing and left the office. When he reached the end of the corridor, he looked through the window. Everything was clear here. Follow me, Peter commanded and started down the stairs. Victoria hurried after him. At the last flight, she stopped. A gray shadow caught her eye. She looked up. It was Sam. He was standing a little away from the stairs, but Victoria wasn't going to talk to him about anything. She lifted the hem of her skirt and quickened her step. For the first time in her life, fear for her life and her reputation settled inside Victoria. She was once again ashamed of herself for what she had done. From that day on, peace left Victoria's soul. She worried about the lives of the villagers and her own fate. During dinner, Victoria noticed how Peter, looking for something in the pocket of his jacket, moved his keys from one pocket to another. This key was to his office. Victoria needed to find out if the house actually belonged to her. She needed to see the deeds with her own eyes. That evening, Victoria asked to take Violet away to her room early. The teacher said you need to read more so you can learn to do it faster. Victoria muttered, sending her daughter along with Nena to her room. That's how they stayed at dinner alone with Peter. That evening her husband drank more than one glass of wine, and so you will act as my support. When I talked to the phones, mumbled Peter, sending the sandwich into his mouth. Victoria almost choked on it, barely restraining herself from coughing. She carried the mug with tea to her mouth. And what issue will be raised for discussion? Again asked his wife, wanting to learn more about the upcoming trip. You know everything on the spot, Peter replied. Strong coffee. Afterwards he took out a cigarette and lit it. Peter, we agreed that you would not smoke at the table, Victoria said. Peter puffed hard and let out a big club. Smoke didn't ruin my morning, darling. Peter answered her without blinking an eye. Victoria, taking a mug of tea, returned to her room. Such boorish behavior of her husband was pissing her off beyond belief. But she was. Couldn't do anything about it, to start fighting someone who was knowingly stronger than her. She considered it empty foolishness. By 11 o'clock, the car pulled up to the village administration building. Peter entered the office and began to look for something among the papers. When she asked him what he was looking for, Peter said nothing. Then, finally finding some documents, he went to the farm. Victoria went with him. On the way the woman prayed that she would not be caught by Sam. Outside the office, some of the farm workers had gathered. They all wanted to ask their questions. Victoria was concerned that they were not friendly. Seeing Victoria's Peter, people in gray and dirty clothes turned towards them. When will we get our paychecks? Asked one of the women. She was large with an apron over her jacket. It was obvious that she was missing a couple of teeth. Victoria felt uneasy. Where's our money? It sounded from somewhere to the right. Victoria turned her head and saw a familiar face. It was Grandma Nura, who had been working as a milkmaid on the farm for a long time. The thieves shouted from the crowd. Are you living off us? Angry poked a young girl Victoria with her finger, slammed her saliva down. Her throat was dry. She's never been in an argument like this before. That's why I came to you with my wife, pronounced Peter, not paying any attention to the discontent before wearing this pillar. Victoria looked around at the angry faces with sharp stares raining down on her. Women and men looked at what once lived with them and worked in this dairy and now stands all dressed up in expensive clothes. While they are forced to lead a miserable life, collecting pennies and economizing on every piece of bread. Are you saying that you want a salary? Interrogated Peter, turning to the young girl that stood closest to him. Yes, Peter. Everyone wants to be paid for his labor, she replied, not afraid to look the dairy owner in the eye. Well, I heard you. Let's see how well you work, Peter said with a slee smile. He squinted at the girl, stopping his gaze. What are your duties? He asked. You, lifting her chin with two fingers of your right hand. I make the cream, the girl replied. Very good. Bring it, 
Don't sit there. We'll taste it. How well do you do your job? Sonny said Peter, without removing from his face an unkind smile. The girl hurriedly went into the combine. After came out with a mug, in which fresh cream was poured to half, Victoria watched with bated breath. The mill worker held out the mug of cream to Peter. Everyone around them was silent, not understanding what was happening. Peter brought it to his lips and guzzled a little. It's impossible to drink, it's disgusting. Exclaimed he completely discouraged the girl and giving her the mug back. Excuse me Peter, but the cream is fresh today. She said, confident in her product. Try it again. She handed him the mug a second time. Peter took it in his hands, but instead of taking a second drink, he raised the mug above the girl's head and tilted it. A white mass immediately poured out over her head. His body, face, and speed slowed. He took off his jacket and hung it on the back of a chair. Victoria searched her mind for a plan on how she could take the key from his pocket. She had hoped that Peter would soon be out of the elite going to bed. However, he had no intention of doing so. Ashev rose from his chair with another glass. Victoria also became animated. Peter took his jacket off the chair and put it on again. It was time for Victoria to act. She also got up and with a soft, relaxed gait approached her husband. You again. She spoke in a gentle voice with her palm. She placed it on his shoulders. I have someone else to meet, Peter replied. Victoria kissed his neck. Too bad, the woman replied and meanwhile she ran her hand into the right pocket of her jacket. At that moment, however, she felt Peter's hand on her thigh. She quickly moved her hands behind her husband's head. Can't you stay after all? As a diversion, she asked and then turned her back to him, giving him a deep cut on her back. Victoria herself hid the key under a napkin. When the seduction Peter followed Victoria to his room, he had no idea that he was gentle. The massage done by his wife's strong hands relaxed him so much that he literally fell into a deep sleep. When Victoria was satisfied that Peter was asleep, she went back into the living room and retrieved her keys. She then walked over to her husband's office and opened it with the key. Once alone, Victoria began searching for the documents she needed. Drawer after drawer, folder after folder. But the woman found nothing. Crossing her arms over her chest, she began to think about where they might be. After another look through all sorts of shelves and drawers, Victoria left the office with nothing. She locked the door with the key and returned it to her husband. Then she went back to the desk and picked up her ill-gotten glass of wine. Her gaze fell on Peter's car keys. She took them in her fist and headed for the car. She was so caught up in the idea that she forgot to put her coat on. It was raining outside and a chilling wind was blowing. Victoria climbed into the car, stepping out onto her wet fingers and hands. She looked in the glove compartment. There they were. The thin cardboard folder was lying there without anyone realizing it. Obviously, Peter was just about to do something with them. Victoria ran her eyes over the printed letters. Peter hadn't lied about the house really belonging to her. But then why did he need them? Did he really intend to sell the house? Their families too. Pondering her next move, Victoria put her hand on the back of the chair and then looked at the back seat. Oh my God, there were some more papers lying there, spread out on separate bumps. Victoria immediately began to study them. The humidity didn't soothe the wind. What was pouncing on the locked car doors? Victoria covered herself in goosebumps, but her eyes kept reading line by line. It appeared that Peter was about to file for bankruptcy which meant he would soon be disbanding people from their jobs. The villagers who had already worked and lived on the land for years would now be forced to be destitute and look for a new livable place to live. Victoria decided that she must prevent this from happening immediately. She was undecided whether to go to the village or not right now. And then the car's engine honked. Victoria headed straight for the village. Although the woman had obtained a driver's license, she didn't have enough driving experience. The rain was getting heavier. Victoria was beginning to think she'd overreacted, but she wasn't going to back down. Thanks to the evening time, there were hardly any cars on the street. And so Victoria was on her way to the village, but the rain had washed out the road and a deep puddle had formed. Victoria tried to drive out of it, then drive back then again overcoming it. 
but the rubber from the wheels slides through the mud like butter. Then the woman decided to go around her. She turned the steering wheel to the right and went straight across the field, small bits of roughness that got under the wheels, making the car shake and rock. It went on like this until Victoria was back in the driveway. It was about 20 minutes away from the nearest house. At that moment, however, the car stalled. Victoria furrowed her brow in confusion. The gasoline was at zero. Damn. She cursed, pressing her lips together. The rain kept falling. Victoria looked out of the car window at the wet drops that continuously fell on the windshield and pounded on the roof. But here to her right, she saw a figure with a light from a street lamp. It seemed to be a man on horseback. He was approaching the car blinded by Victoria's spotlight of light. For a moment, Victoria was seized with fear. After a little while, the man turned off the flashlight, got down from his horse, and tapped the window. As much as Victoria hated to open it, circumstances forced her to do so. Isn't it a little late for you to be here? In this weather, a familiar voice said. Victoria recognized Sam. She had to admit she was glad to see him at this hour. We're out of fuel. I didn't have time to mumble. Victoria's wet strands of her hair made her even more interesting. Why are you here? Sam asked. In this miserable weather, he acted so calm, as if nothing bothered him. I'm actually here. It's very important to the villagers. The woman spoke. Raindrops fell on her face. She squinted and occasionally pressed her lips together to remove the excess moisture. But now it's late everyone is asleep. Sam was in no hurry. He remembered their last meeting and how horribly her husband had behaved with a defenseless girl. Victoria was silent. He was right to leave her here to deal with her problems herself. I have money, I'd pay for a night's lodging. The woman mumbled, not wanting to be inconvenienced. Sam opened the car door, held out his hand to her. Victoria, as she had the first time they met, placed her own on his palm. Sam sat Victoria on the horse and then jumped in himself. In a matter of minutes, they reached the first building. Sam lowered Victor down to the ground and then tied the horse under the shed. Then Sam opened the door. There was a light on. Victoria walked inside stunned. What is this? Where have you brought me? She asked, looking around. A small iron stove, a narrow bed around bales of hay. This is your lodging, Sam replied. To say that Victoria was completely bewildered, that's not to say anything. The woman decided not to give the appearance that she was extremely displeased. She figured she wouldn't have to stay here. She got straight to the point. Sam tossed in some wood. The heat from the food began to flow more strongly. The cold that had accumulated inside the body. Women began to come out, once again covering her skin with goosebumps. What were you doing in the field? Victoria inquired. Sam didn't look at her. He was taking off his outer clothes, hanging them on a rope, what were strung from the ceiling. Some of them had birch brooms hanging from them. I'm a part-time shepherd. That evening the calf didn't come home. I went to look for him, Sam replied, seeming to show no interest in his guest. Found it, she asked. Found it, replied the man, taking the seat on an old wooden chair and looking at the fire. I'm here on business, Victoria began. She gathered her hair into a bun and squeezed the excess water out of it. This caught Sam's attention. He raised his eyes to her and hummed. Victoria answered him in the same way. Sam then slowly ran his gaze over her body, clad in a beautiful long brown colored dress. Victoria felt incredibly uncomfortable at the sight of such a candid look. Victoria continued, I need help, or rather, not only me, but also the villagers. That your husband kicked you out? Sam asked sarcastically. Victoria ignored his question. My husband. He misjudged his strength a bit. Victoria looked into Sam's eyes and then shifted her gaze back to the fire. She could feel the dress clinging to her body, causing a slight irritation. And now he wants to sell off the farms, the loaves, the bakeries. There will be nowhere for people to work. Victoria had missed the main reason for where it had all started. She didn't want to speak ill of her husband, after all, whatever he was. He had provided a good life for her and her child. I managed to get hold of some documents that my husband could do that. Victoria finished. Now she had said all she had to say. 
and it was up to the residents themselves to decide their fate. But Sam didn't seem to be interested in that at all. My husband, my husband, he repeated, rising to his feet and approaching Victoria almost closely, and again, as if from nowhere, a heat began to flare up inside her, turning into a primal instinct. Did you drive all the way out here in the rain to tell me about this? He asked. Yes, replied the woman briefly. Despite the fact that Sam was at a critically close distance from her, she had no intention of moving away from him. To her surprise, she was even enjoying the contact between her and this man at some points in their bodies. Their gazes settled on each other. After another moment, their lips melded in a kiss. The cool skin of her face, shoulders, chest, and stomach began to fill with warmth and then heat. There was no strength to stop at all. I wanted to drown in an abyss of sensation and pleasure. The fire was burning in the furnace. Victoria grabbed the gas can she had been allowed to take by Sam. Victoria was about to leave. Are you leaving already? Asked Sam in a sleepy voice. I need to get back soon. The car isn't mine, she replied. And you would have stayed with me forever. Suddenly Sam asked, catching Victoria by the arm. Victoria was not ready to answer that question. She knew the answers to it, but was Sam ready to hear it? I have to hurry. Victoria tried to evade the answer. You don't love him and he doesn't care about you. Sam blurted out. Victoria felt her eyes. She didn't like hearing that. Especially since Sam had no right to say anything about her relationship with her husband. I'll handle it myself, she said in a calm tone and released her wrist. At five o'clock Victoria was already home. She was terribly tired and about other things. Parked the car in the same spot as before. She entered the house almost silently. She put the keys to the car in the same place. The maid had already cleaned up the chair, so the keys lay all alone. Victoria looked into her husband's room and he was still asleep. So she went back to her room and turned on the hot water to fill the bathtub. She took off her dress with great pleasure and stepped into the warm, almost hot liquid with a pleasant sweet scent. No, Victoria would not for anything in the world be willing to trade her life for a life in the countryside or anywhere else for love. And that was the truth. Sam was very handsome. But Victoria had enough life experience not to want to trade comfort for a life in a hovel. The woman plunged headfirst into the water. Clean, warm water. Her whole body washed away the smell of Sam. Afterward, she lay in bed and fell into a sweet sleep. In the morning, Peter woke up extremely angry. He remembered that he still hadn't sorted out the documents and there was too little time left. He entered the office. Victoria had time to peek after him from the office to hear rustling and Peter's displeasure. Victoria felt her heart sink. Peter must have discovered the missing documents by now. The woman remained in her room. Victoria prepared herself to have to lie or make up something in her defense. Just then the door swung open and Violetta ran into the room. A stone fell from Victoria's chest when she heard her voice. Evelyn's mom said it's your turn to drive me to school today. And she did in her baby voice. Isn't that fun, her mother interjected. But then I'll get dressed quickly and go with you. She said and immediately started packing. Give me a hint. Dad has already left. Asked the girl mom. No, he's still here. I'll ask him to drive us. Violetta said excitedly, but Victoria stopped her, telling her that it was better not to disturb Daddy. Victoria Violetta managed to leave the house unnoticed. They had already gotten into a cab when Peter approached their car. He searched it all over, but did not find the documents he was supposed to bring to the buyer. Where is Victoria? Annoyed, he asked Evelyn. She took Violet to school. It's Wednesday, she always takes her herself on that day the maid explained. Peter bit his lower lip and then returned to his office. He was annoyed. Now he would have to somehow explain to the man why he couldn't make a deal. When Victoria returned, Peter was gone. The woman immediately contacted the lawyer. Having arranged a meeting, she immediately went to him by cab. Good afternoon. Victoria greeted him. In his office. Hello. Come in. A man of 40 answered her. He was tall and thin, clearly had a historical type of physique. Have a seat, he said, pointing with a large palm to the chair across from his desk. 
Victoria obediently sat down, waiting for him to finish writing something down in his notebook. The lawyer's name was Robert. Continuing to hold the ballpoint pen in his hands, he sank into the chair, scrutinizing the woman, trying to disrupt the pause that had appeared. Victoria clapped her eyelashes frequently and, asking for a handkerchief around her neck, began her story. Robert listened to the woman and then offered his own solution. This is not the case. Yes, the situation is not easy. The lawyer clutched the pen tightly with his fingers. But fortunately, we have a safe place to store the documents. Just for just such an occasion. Encouraging, he stated. Then he stood up and walked to the window and back. When he stopped, he fixed his gaze on Victorious again. What? What is it? His visitor interrogated him, not understanding his reverie. We'll hide the document. But you, Victoria, you yourself are protected. With this question, he stumped her. What do you mean? Victoria said slowly, picking up in her head the possible future developments. As I understand it, your husband is quite a gambler, a big risk taker, and also quite cold and calculating, Robert said. What's your point? Still didn't understand. Victoria, do you really think that Peter might start threatening me? She asked a question that didn't seem to occur to her in any way. Yes, Peter was a big gambler. He made big bets. Yes, he could be too strict. His lessons are not always pleasant, but he has to be. I mean, he has a lot of people under his command. Victoria, your husband didn't just take the deeds to a house that legally belongs to you, the lawyer said, trying to be more convincing. He wanted to make the woman realize that if she hid this document away and thought that the matter was done, she was wrong. But the house belongs to our daughter too. Get out. Victoria continued to object. There was no way she could allow that thought. Victoria, you came to see me? I'm telling you what's going to happen. If you don't believe me, then why all this talk? I'm not going to coddle you here, said Robert, who immediately regretted his words. Victoria raised his eyebrows. It's a shame that someone as smart as you can't be patient, Victoria said and headed for the door. As she stepped out into the hallway, she paused, considering who else she could turn to. Robert was good at this kind of card business. His card had been in Victoria's notebook for a long time. A friend of hers had urged her to keep it just in case. Victoria was about to leave when suddenly Victoria's voice was heard behind her back. Come into the office, please, said Robert. The woman stayed where she was. Please excuse my impertinence. Let's talk it over again, he said. Victoria turned around. The lawyer was so tall that she had to lift her chin very high to look him in the eye at close range. The papers will stay here. You don't have to worry about them. But as for you, please keep me in touch and informed, he said and handed Victoria his personal phone number. Call me any time of the day or night, Robert added. Victoria took the slip of paper with the number from his hands. Now she was really getting uncomfortable. Let's get started on the paperwork, the lawyer said taking a pen and a blank piece of paper. When all the formalities were done, Victoria went home. Just as she crossed the threshold of the house she was met by Evelyn. She was excited. Victoria Peter, very angry. He can't find any documents. I'm afraid there's going to be a scandal, she added. Where is Violetta the first thing the child's mother asked? She had told Evelyn in a half whisper at school. Thank you for the warning. Victoria replied having recovered from the noise in her husband's study. Opening the door, she found a pile of papers strewn everywhere. Peter stood in front of the capital's hands. He was drunk, his shirt collar reached, his tie was lying on the floor. What's going on? Asked Victoria, portraying on her face. Complete incomprehension. Why are you drunk? It's not lunch yet, Victoria said. But Peter wasn't paying attention to her. He continued to stand, rocking back and forth. None of your business, Peter said and wiped his lips. Then he went to the minibar in the closet and poured himself some more whiskey. You have to stop. You could scare our daughter. Victoria tried to speak in a soft and calm voice. This is all because of you. This is all because of you, shouted Peter, threatening Victoria's face with his index finger. The woman was afraid that he had guessed everything. You couldn't give me a son. You deprived me of the most precious thing. You deprived me of the meaning of life, he shouted. 
Peter had gone completely mad. Victoria did not recognize her husband, who had once been a very reserved, intelligent, and decent young man. You know I've always loved you, Victoria said. And partly she wasn't lying from the very first day they met. She was in love with him very much. However, she couldn't carry that love through the long days and nights spent alone. She couldn't love him the same way after the time when she needed him most, and he wasn't there for her. Now in Victoria's heart her love for her husband was only a fraction of the memories of their first year together. You need to get some sleep, Victoria added, and left his office going into her room. The time was approaching winter, and so the city began to experience frequent rains with snow and slush all around. This kind of weather both brought longing and sadness, and at the same time made heads fresh and thoughts clear. You have to take this responsibility, Victoria Sam was saying. You can't just give up and throw dozens of lives away, Victoria persuaded him. The woman wanted Sam to become the owner of the farm, the bread of the bakery. She saw in him a decent man and a responsible manager. Are you crazy? Who am I? Sam wondered. I'm not ready to take on so much. I'm just a simple worker, doing my small role. Sam said, not finding the strength to take such a step. Everything starts small, Victoria replied. Do you just have to try it? I'm sure you can do it. I see you as a talented leader. You are impartial, intelligent, and good at what you do. You're fearless, and you're dependable. Is that the kind of person I want to trust? Victoria said. These words in a half whisper. Then she ran her hands over Sam's face. People will follow you. Her lips touched his. A few seconds passed. Sam was still running those words through his head. Then he answered the woman's kisses, his hands sliding down Victoria's body. He missed her so much, pressing her body even tighter against his. He could no longer resist the passion he had ignited. The two lowered themselves onto a small haystack. Nothing around them mattered. Victoria got up and walked over to the firebox. She tossed a couple logs into the fire, quickly grabbed them, and the barn became much warmer. You are very beautiful, pronounced Sam in a quiet voice. Victoria smiled softly at him in return. We need to get the papers ready, Victoria said as she put on her dress. Are you serious about doing this? Sam took on a puzzled look. And you thought we'd just chat and call it a day. The woman laughed, then cleared a drawer from the wall and laid her handkerchief on it. Then she took out a pen and blank sheets of paper, spread out the papers in front of her. She began to draw up a new one in Sam's name. Are you crazy? Sam said, approaching Victoria. The woman neatly wrote down everything that was necessary for the reissue. I just don't want the village I grew up in to be torn apart. Victoria replied as she continued to write the letters. You don't remember me? Sam suddenly asked. I do, the woman replied briefly, remembering the guy nine years ago who had looked at her with a shovel of cow dung. When Victoria finished, she put everything in a cardboard folder, tied it with a string and headed for the exit. Are you leaving already? Sam didn't want to leave her so soon. I have to finish what I started. Victoria answered dryly and went out the door. The woman was in a hurry. Now was not the time to discuss their feelings. When she arrived home, she found Peter drunk again. He was sitting in his office. He was depressed and clearly saw no way out of the situation. Victoria went to her daughter's room. She was reading a book with Evelyn. Seeing her mother, the girl jumped from her chair and clung to her. You're my sunshine. It's been so long since I've seen you, she said, sinking into the chair. What are you reading today? She asked. Today we are reading about a princess who didn't want to go out. Violetta said, Are you my princess? Victoria kissed her daughter on the cheek. Evelyn turned to Nina. Please don't leave Violetta alone. There's no telling where she might go to have adventures. With a laugh in her voice, Victoria enclosed the girl in a hug. Being at home, Victoria watched her husband. She felt like a bad person, but she couldn't stop now. Walking into his office, she silently approached Peter. I didn't call you, you get out of here, Peter muttered. I'm worried about you, Victoria muttered, and for our future. And she wasn't lying about that. Why did you tell me what you intend to do? His wife asked him. It's not for a woman's mind, Peter replied. Please, don't drink anymore. 
Victoria said and took his glass. Together with him, she went to the window. And while Peter could not see what was going on behind her back, Victoria squirted drops of an illegal substance into his glass. It was relatively safe. It was relaxing and soothing give me back my glass woman. Peter said. And for God's sake, leave me alone, he muttered irritably. Victoria returned the glass to its place and left the office he was drying its contents. His wife remained outside the door and watched him. The substance had clearly begun to take effect. Peter rubbed his forehead and then leaned back in his chair. Victoria entered his office again. This time she was with papers in her hands. Peter, do you know that our daughter is showing an aptitude for music? She began. Peter was silent. He had heard everything, but he didn't care about it now. I decided to send her to a music school. Victoria continued to speak in an affectionate voice. I don't have time for that now, answered Peter. Rubbing his eyes, it was getting hard for him to focus. I know, and that's why I've taken care of everything. All you have to do is sign it. Victoria carefully placed the two sheets in front of her husband. You know we're going through some hard times right now. Peter started to object. Yes, but that shouldn't affect you in any way. Victoria continued to bend his line. What do you want? Peter muttered. He got up from his chair to walk around a little and to cheer up his brain. Victoria was afraid Peter was about to leave the office. I just repeated my agreement on paper to Victoria. Where is tired? Asked Peter, taking a ballpoint pen. Here Victoria put her index finger, and here Peter quickly crossed out his signature. Afterwards he threw the pen on the table. Violetta will be happy, Victoria said. I won't bother you, she said and went back to her room. Her heart was pounding frantically. She had just committed a dangerous act that could have very unpleasant consequences. Victoria took another look at all the paperwork. Everything had been completed as desired. From now on the law was Sam the owners of the dairy and the bakery. The next morning Peter didn't wake up until just before lunchtime. After packing some things, he left the house without saying anything about it. Three days had already passed and he was still gone. Victoria was worried about him as the man she had lived with for nine years. One might think Victoria was playing a double game, and that was partly true. But what would you do if you were in a similar situation? Peter was in another city all these days trying to find a way out. After all, when he was supposed to go to a meeting with those he owed money to, he got into the car. Peter turned around to check if his documents were in place. When he didn't find them there, he was stunned. Peter tried to remember if he had taken them with him to the office or if he had left them in the car. He was angry with himself and his confusion about the search and the whole cabin. And looking under the seat and then into the glove compartment, Peter felt his pulse clearing with each passing second. Peter, I get the impression you're making a fool of me. A low male bass voice said, I realize it sounds absurd, no less. But it really is. The documents have disappeared. Peter repeated. Above his upper lip arena, a man of tall stature and obviously overweight appeared. Made himself comfortable in the chair buttons on his shirt, felt the strain. It seemed like they were about to break free. I have a house that I inherited from my parents. Peter began to speak. His voice sounded uncertain. It's not enough, I know. But the money from its sale will cover at least part of the debt. I can work off the rest, Peter said honestly. I'll take out a loan, I'll think of something. Peter jumped at every even dubious opportunity. I hear you have a daughter, the man said. Peter froze. He didn't know what to say to him. P.S. I have a daughter, but she is only eight years old. Peter said with trembling lips. You wouldn't his lips trembled more. It was a sign that deep down Peter loved his daughter and treasured her. There was pure laughter. Would you have seen your face? Peter's interlocutor laughed. Peter gave a nervous smile. Sweat appeared on his forehead. He took out a handkerchief and dabbed at it. And your wife, the one who was owed, continued the conversation. Rumor has it that she's incredibly attractive. Is it true? He asked Peter. I would like you, Arthur, to leave my family out of this. They have nothing to do with this. I'll put things another way. I promised Hullock. Don't. Peter turned to crying. You'll see him. Arthur ordered it. 
two sturdy guys in black jackets and black shirts, picked Peter up under the arms and led him away. They then led him out of the building and threw him onto the road. Peter lay in the snow with his nose smashed. The cold brought him to his senses. He got up and limped to his car. He didn't want to go back to the city, so he got himself a room in a cheap hotel. That evening he got drunk again. On the fourth day of Peter's absence, there was a knock at Victoria's house. The woman opened the door herself. Two tall men in black jackets stood in front of her. What happened? Victoria asked, not guessing the possible reasons, You'll find out soon, one of them said and offered Victoria to come with them. Victoria was silent for a few seconds, pondering her decision. I wouldn't advise you to try to escape. It's impossible. The other man said and took a step towards the woman. I need to say goodbye to my daughter, Victoria said. Okay, you have two minutes. The first said condescendingly. Victoria, breathing heavily, entered the children's room. Violetta was practicing her hands. Next to her was Evelyn. Everything is well. The maid asked. Yes, I have to leave on business, to talk to a customer. Victoria lied, trying to speak as calmly as possible. While her mother said Violetta kissed her mother firmly. Victoria smiled at her, then headed for the exit. The men in suits were still waiting for her on the doorstep, pointing to the black car with their hand. They waited patiently for the woman to get into the car. Victoria tried not to panic. Where are we going? She asked. Silence followed in response. Okay. To myself, Victoria replied. After a couple hours of driving, the car finally stopped. The door opened and a man in a suit motioned for Victoria to follow him. The woman looked around. She had a spacious garden with snow lying somewhere. The whole area was enclosed by a fence of thick parallel iron bars that ended in a spike at the very top. Do not delay, the man said kindly. Then Victoria, with an escort at her side, walked into the three-story mansion. The craftsman had done a very good job on its interior a little while later, walking up the stairs. The woman found herself in the elaborately furnished room in which the man sat. So this is how the man pronounced it, rising from his seat. Victoria felt a lump approaching her throat. I'm sorry, but I'm a little confused as to what I'm doing here. Who are you? She asked directly. My name is Arthur. But for you, Victoria, I can just be Archie. He said and kissed the woman's hand. How do you know my name? She asked again. Arthur laughed. Are you more curious than I thought? Victoria, I didn't understand his joke. She waited patiently for the reason she was here to become clear. When she saw the clock on the wall, Victoria glanced at it often, as if waiting for something. You know I've always been interested in looking at the woman who happens to be the wife of the head of the village administration. Victoria took a look. Now she guessed why she was here. I'll admit, honestly I expected anything. But I in no way thought they had such marvelous beauty. Arthur ran his finger along Victoria's neck. At that moment she felt like a hunted lamb. However, she was beginning to guess that Arthur had no intention of hurting or bullying her. He truly wanted to enjoy her company. Victoria thought quickly and determined her own tactics. I have to admit, I didn't think I'd be meeting such a charming man. Gently Victoria flew by, though it is not proper to say that about her husband, but he bored me a little, Victoria continued, turning into a slave fox. Even so, Arthur expressed his surprise. Don't worry, you won't get bored with me, he said and kissed Victoria's hand again. The woman smiled slyly. Arthur was discouraged by the courage and beauty of a woman who had to find herself in such circumstances through her husband's fault. However, he himself was unspoken about it. Gladly. Would you like to celebrate our meeting in a luxurious restaurant? He suggested, being fully confident, that he had succeeded in impressing Victoria. Victoria said with pleasure. With a charming look, Arthur broke out into a smile. He was flattered by her answer. Thirty minutes later, the black car drove out of the house. Victoria continued to play the role of a woman suddenly in love. The dinner passed in a quiet atmosphere. There was almost no one in the hall. Good music was playing. Arthur tried to charm Victoria even more, telling her the most incredible stories, as well as about his business, to which he gives a lot of effort. Excuse me, what is the name of your business? 
Victoria asked. I am involved in the development of art, Arthur began. I have a large number of galleries. Victoria's eyes widened. I must certainly look in some of them. Victoria exclaimed. And here she was quite sincere. Oh, we'll certainly go there. Today too, Arthur said, there was such an ebullient interest in his activities. Victoria held out her glass and they clinked glasses. Already in the evening, when it was dark outside, they went to the gallery, to what was on the embankment, blowing right out of sight. The wind was blowing wet snow out of the sky. The weather was so-so. Passing a display case of the world's drinks, an enthusiastic Arthur asked the driver to slow down. Then he personally went to the store himself. When he returned ten minutes later, he threw a large mink fur shawl over Victoria's shoulders. Victoria couldn't stop thanking him. Ah, what generosity, so unexpected. Archie, you never cease to amaze me, she said. So quickly and imperceptibly she switched to you. Arthur reached up to Victoria and kissed her on the lips. Victoria playfully glanced at him. Finally, the driver pulled over. The two went to a building whose facade was decorated with interesting and unusual moldings. The faces with their horns twisted and their tongues sticking out were more awe-inspiring than the desire to admire them. When Victoria stepped inside the building, she was struck by its extraordinary fullness with various works of art. My God, it's incredible. What beauty! Victoria marveled, trying to look at all the details. This picture was painted by an artist back in the 14th century, Arthur said. He was reminded of pride. Victoria shook her head sideways, never ceasing to be amazed. Arthur and Victoria walked through all three halls and then found themselves in a small room the floor, which was highlighted by a rug with a big question. A fireplace also caught her eye. Are you cold? Arthur asked her, putting his arm around her shoulders and then started to light the fire. I didn't think art lovers could start a fire, Victoria muttered. But that's how my father taught me, Arthur replied. I'm from a small town myself, so I'm familiar with this sort of thing. Bring water, bring wood, chop wood. That was easy for me to say, Arthur. I'm easy to pick up. As you can probably tell, I've done it all by myself, he said, proud of his accomplishments. Victoria looked around the room. There was a large upholstered sofa, beige in color with a table. A small refrigerator stood in the corner. Arthur moved closer to Victoria again and exposed her shoulders. Victoria held her breath. The man began to caress her skin, inhaling her scent. Victoria realized that things had gone too far. She took on the appearance of a cute kitty cat. Playfully, she tried to escape from her hunter. Arthur was terribly amused. But at the very moment when Arthur was ready to sink down on the sofa with Victoria, there was a shrill alarm sound. Dumbfounded, Arthur jumped to his feet, looking around and figuring out which way to run. Victoria also put her cape back in place and rushed for the exit. Arthur, as well as his guards, were perplexed as to what was the reason for the alarm going off. While the guards, pistols drawn, moved through the halls to identify the thief, Victoria headed straight for the exit around the corner from the gallery, which was unlit by light. She bumped into Robert, for it was to him she was. When she went to say goodbye to her daughter, you're fine. The first thing the lawyer asked, he spoke in a whisper and tried to remain unnoticed. Yeah, I'm fine. What took you so long? Victoria abruptly switched to a question. We can't take him in right now. There's no reason to. You'll have to hold on to him for a while longer, Robert said. I'm not sure I can do that. Victoria whispered as loudly as she could. They're coming, I'll be right behind them. That's all the lawyer had time to say. And then he took off into the bushes. Victoria, are you all right? Arthur asked her this time. Fortunately, yes. Victoria answered, pretending to be short of breath. We have to get out of here. It's dangerous to stay here, Arthur said. And, taking Victoria by the hand, went with her to the car when they got home. It took Arthur a long time to come to his senses. Now in front of Victoria, he looked so vulnerable and frightened, as if the child had gone somewhere, all his pomp and pomposity. Victoria, I'd like to continue talking to you. But today's incident has thrown me off my game. I have to call someone. And then I'd like to be alone, he said. Yes, of course, I understand, Victoria replied. 
But that doesn't mean you can leave, Arthur added suddenly. And really, why would Victoria think that? There's a lovely room up there for you. You can rest properly and have a good time. Vanessa will see you out, he said, and then pressed a button. A woman who obviously worked here as an au pair soon appeared. Come with me, she said. The greeting surprised Victoria. She said goodbye to Arthur, and afterward went after the woman, who was a native of either Mexico or Spain. The au pair was a very nice woman. She showed and told Victoria everything. She also asked if she would like something to eat. Victoria shook her head in the negative. She left, when it was getting dark and night had fallen. Victoria decided to leave the room and explore Arthur's house. She guessed that Arthur was the man to whom her husband had lost at cards, which meant that somewhere in here might not hold the paper on which Arthur would collect the debt. The door creaked familiarly. The woman tiptoed along the hallway. She approached each door and tried to open it. However, her idea proved to be a failure. All the doors of the rooms were locked. Victoria wondered and why so many rooms for a person who lived all alone. Finally, she saw Vanessa walk out of one of them without locking it through the open door. Victoria had time to realize that this room was either a meeting room or Arthur's office. After giving her a glance, she stepped through that door. Indeed, it was Arthur's office. Finding the documents she needed here was more difficult than Victoria had realized. Quickly trying not to make any noise, Victoria went through the papers that lay directly on the desk. The right document was not among them. Victoria returned the boxes. But how? Of course they were on the key. Footsteps were heard. Victoria glared. She thought of nothing better than to hide behind the curtains. Sam God, there were thick, long curtains hanging on the windows here. Victoria kept her cool. Trying to remain calm, Vanessa wiped the desk with some kind of product injected on it, then looked around and checked the potted palm tree that stood in the corner of the office just where Victoria had hidden. Luckily, it was all gone. Vanessa, not suspecting anything, walked out the door, which she hadn't locked behind her. Getting out of the voluminous antique, Victoria approached the table again. She stopped intently, looking at the papers that lay on it. Ah, here it is she muttered to herself, picking up the document in which her husband acknowledged his obligation to repay the debt. Victoria quickly twisted the document into a two and hid it in the sleeve of her dress. Footsteps were heard again. Victoria looked out the door no one, but on the field and got out into the corridor and headed for her room. Victoria, what are you doing here? A servant's voice rang out. Victoria strained a smile. I heard a noise and thought I'd check to see if everyone was sleeping okay. Not yet, she lied. I always cleaned Arthur's room late at night. That's just the way it is, Vanessa muttered. Well, I'll be off, Victoria said, saying good night. The maid nodded her head and went back into the study. Victoria went back to her room. In her room, she found a cell phone. She immediately contacted the lawyer. Everything was going as well as it could, Robert reported. He hadn't realized that this woman's appeal would help him get so easily and so quickly close to one of the biggest owners of the House of Cards. Until now, he had always managed to sneak away or find protection for himself. But now that Victoria is in his home, she can provide him with the evidence he needs. Victoria, please remain calm, the lawyer was telling her. It's easy to say, he's just about to attack me. The woman complained indignantly to him. Can you do it? I believe in you. And I'm always here for you, Robert said and hung up. Victoria took a deep breath. The next day Arthur and Victoria met for breakfast. Arthur was in a very good mood. He was humming something and joking a lot. Victoria pretended that she was enjoying it all and was in a good mood. I'd like to try painting too, Victoria said. That's great. We'll do it today, Arthur decided. Where will we go? The woman expressed her curiosity. Well, it'll be a surprise, Arthur answered her, which puzzled Victoria a little. After all, if she didn't know where they were going, she wouldn't be able to tell Robert. Do you like surprises? Arthur asked her. Of course I love surprises. Again the woman lied. Finally, the two, along with the guards, arrived at the workshop. It really looked like the most ordinary artist's studio. An easel, rags, paints, brush, solvent brushes. 
Victoria hadn't realized that it took so many bad-smelling mediums to paint pictures. What are we going to paint? Victoria asked excitedly. I'm going to paint the most adorable creature on earth, Arthur said, walking over to Victoria and brushing her curls off her shoulders. He pulled down her sleeves. A rustle of paper was heard, but Arthur paid no attention to it. Then he dropped his hands behind his back to decipher the corset. Victoria was discouraged, a little more, and he would discover that she had hidden the document of the dear march up her sleeve. I know you're impatient, but if I don't start drawing, now I'm afraid I won't have the strength later, she spoke in a soft timber. And you are not easy, you are not at all. Arthur laughed, he seemed to enjoy this kind of game. The woman was glad to herself that she had managed to delay. Finally, Victoria stood in front of the blank canvas with a brush in her hands and a blank head. She began to run the brush across the canvas, pretending as if she were painting something incredible. Her face radiated interest and surprise mixed with delight. Arthur waited patiently for his new friend to enjoy the colors to the fullest. At this moment, she was like a child who was completely immersed in her craft. But I think you're tired now, don't you? Arthur said, standing up next to Victoria. For two minutes he was silent, looking at what this woman had done. The riot of colors and shades perfectly combined into an image of sunlight. In a pine forest, you are simply marvelous, Arthur finally mumbled. He was genuinely surprised by what he had gotten in the end. You really think so? Ivana asked excitedly. Arthur nodded and nestled his head against Victoria's lips. I can't wait any longer. You're too beautiful, you're too smart, he said, covering Victoria's neck chest with kisses. At that moment, however, gunshots rang out. Victoria flinched. Arthur bounced off the woman, frozen in an attack pose. What's going on? Victoria asked him. She really couldn't guess what it was. A moment later, several men in police uniforms burst into the workshop. Everyone stay where you are. Shouted the most important of them, Victoria saw genuine consternation in Arthur's eyes. What's going on? Who are you? Arthur asked them. You are under arrest and must go to the police station immediately, the policeman explained. I didn't do anything. It's a mistake. Arthur tried to justify himself. Victoria was beginning to believe him. Are the gambling houses your mistake too? Did someone ask a question? Victoria looked up. It was Robert. A look of relief came over her face. So the big tangle had found its beginning and end. Arthur had been sent to jail. This was facilitated by Victoria, who managed to get a document confirming the fact of the gambling houses. Her husband Peter divorced his wife and moved to another city. He left his former life forever, his job as head of the administration, the gambling houses, and even Maria, who, as she herself said, loved him more than anything else in the world. Victoria was glad that the village remained as it was and had not been sold off. As she had planned, the owner of the dairy and bakery became Sam. However, the name alone was not enough. The man had to work hard to set up the business and make it profitable. Victoria herself continued to live in her house. She lived quite modestly, but she had her own business, which filled her and brought meaning to life, spending a lot of time in the garden. She attracted more and more people to decorate their homes and restaurants with her flower arrangements. As for her daughter Violetta, she continued to study, and then really started practicing music. The girl was making incredible progress. Deep down Victoria hoped that her daughter would grow up and thanks to her talent, successfully married. Victoria did not put her own personal life. Everything suited her as it was. She was quite satisfied with it. As mentioned earlier, she was not ready to trade a comfortable life in her own home for love. Ten years had passed. Many things have changed. Violetta grew up and became an adult. She still practiced music. Playing the violin, she could stay immersed in the action for hours at a time. Returning from class one day, she passed by the street musicians of the city. She was attracted to one young man who played the piano. His music was so exciting, so sensual. Violetta had never heard anything like it before. Next to him were two others. One was collecting money and the other was playing a piper. She moved a little closer to him and his crew. 
Catching the rhythm, she put the violin in the right position and began to drive the bow. The melody combining the instruments was simply exhilarating. In a matter of minutes, a large crowd of people gathered around and could not pass by without listening to this splendor. Who are you? Asked her the guy who played the piano when they finished playing the melody. My name is Violetta. You play well, she remarked, immediately throwing in a compliment. I'm Greg. I haven't seen you around here before. You're dressed too well for a street musician, the guy said. He looked about 20 years old. After looking at Violetta, he took out a cigarette and lit it. Shall we go for a walk? I suggested, he winked. The girl didn't mind. A friendship developed between Greg and Violetta. Almost every day they met in the park and started playing. Then, after finishing playing, Greg would cover the piano with a number, and they would go for a walk together. Victoria noticed that her daughter began to stay late after school frequently. Two weeks later, she's, her my dear girl, you started coming home later. Have you got a boyfriend? Victoria asked, looking into her daughter's room. You have to talk about it. Violetta answered a question with a question. She didn't want to discuss her personal life with her mother. I just want you to stay out of trouble and not to grow up in a hurry. Victoria said, I'll take care of it myself. Okay, mom, replied her daughter. Okay. But you have to think about your future first, her mother said. I remember, Violetta answered her. Victoria went to her room. Violetta started to do her homework. It was hard to concentrate. Her mother's words hurt the girl because she realized that the bright future of street musicians is not coming soon. But it's not so terrible. Like the fact that Violetta was crazy about him. They really loved each other. It's easy. So did Violetta. It was well known that her mother would never approve of her choice. Finally making up her mind, Violetta still invited Greg to dinner with her family. The cook had prepared a delicious meal, and she tried to please the guests. When Greg entered the house and said hello, Victoria immediately realized what he was made of. Remaining gracious and friendly, she invited him and her daughter to the table. You must have been awfully hungry while you were getting here, Victoria said with a smile. Yes, you're right, Victoria. I would love to taste your treats, the boy said cheerfully. Violetta glowed with happiness. It's already off to a good start. And what do you do, Greg? Asked Victoria the question that Violetta was most afraid of. I love freedom, the guy replied. Light and easy. He wasn't going to pretend to be anything else. Oh yeah, would you explain what that means? Mother Violetta asked. I'm a free flying musician. I don't know anyone anything, and I don't know anyone anything. And this is true happiness, he pronounced at the stove an accurate cutlet. Victoria couldn't help but smile at his remarks partly and partly contained in his words. Really? And how do you and Violetta plan to live together? And if there will be a child? Victoria asked the most interesting question to her mom. We're in no hurry. Her daughter intervened. It is clear that you are in no hurry, but nevertheless, Greg. She turned to her daughter's suitors. We'll think of something. I have a house in the country. My parents live there. They'll always help. We'll have cows. You can survive on your own farm. Do you know how cheerfully Greg spoke? Victoria's eyes widened considerably. She had not expected such a turn of events. When her mouth felt dry, Victoria raised her glass with juice. It's beautiful here, Greg said. Looking around, Violetta giggled. After dinner, Greg played a little tune on the piano that stood in the corner of the living room. Victoria had to admit that he played very well. However, that was not a sign of a happy future. Greg said goodbye and left his friend's house. But like mom, did you like him? With joy in her voice, Victoria was asked by her daughter. He's really nice, he really is. Violetta continued to cheer up. He's so sincere, so simple. He has nothing to hide, and I love him for that. Violetta flopped down on his bed. I wouldn't advise you to take their decision so soon. Her mother answered her. You are still so young, so young. Take your time, my dear, Victoria said, stroking her daughter's hair. A couple more weeks passed. The lated Violetta flew into the house and almost collided with Evelyn. Careful, Violetta, please. You're a girl, she didn't miss the opportunity to read the admonition. Mom, shouted the daughter. Then she walked to her mother's room. 
was reading a book after a long time transplanting plants. Mom, I'm getting married. Violetta blurted out. That Victoria immediately put the book aside and sat on the bed. What marriage? To whom? She rushed with questions, feeling her breath catch in her chest. To Greg. He said he'd arrange everything. Violet jumped up, then took her mother's hands and began to spin around. Victoria stayed where she was. Digesting what she'd heard when, when the wedding party was finally able to mumble. Victoria as she pulled back from the shock. Two weeks later, sang Violetta and spun around in a dance again. As only Victoria did not dissuade her daughter, what only her life did not prophesize, and warned how difficult it is to live when you do not have enough money, but all to no avail. Violetta flatly refused to listen to her mother. Victoria went back to her room. She paced from side to side and couldn't find her place. Victoria could not allow her talented girl to spin her life into a redneck. Preparations for the wedding were in full swing. A seamstress arrived at the house. She asked Violet to wear the dress to identify flaws and tweak the rendition. Victoria entered Violetta's room. She walked the bride-to-be around, inspecting her outfit. You are very beautiful. It's just a shame you don't appreciate yourself, Victoria muttered. Didn't I teach you that? Victoria said in a trembling voice. She was really afraid and worried about the future of her only daughter, who was now an adult and needed to accept it. But still, the maternal bond always remains very strong throughout the life of mother and child. Mommy loves me very much, Violetta said, wanting to reassure her mother. My girl, unfortunately, in our material world it is not always possible to live a happy life at the expense of love alone, Victoria continued hoping deep down that her daughter would hear her. At this moment, however, Violetta did not say anything to her mother. She silently looked at herself in the mirror. The girl's gut began to fill with anger and hatred. She tried to hold it together, but at some point she let out what she really wanted to say to her mother. I know why you say that, Violetta said, in a raised tone, because you yourself have never loved my father. You don't know what love is at all. I don't want to be like you. I don't want to settle accounts. Violetta blurted out like a dog off the chain. She screamed like a wild animal, as if all the things she had accumulated were suddenly bursting out. Victoria was stunned by her words. She had never heard anything like that before. In an instant, her daughter had become a completely different person. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That was all Victoria could utter. And then she left her daughter alone with the dressmaker. And Victoria brewed herself some soothing tea taking a mug with a hot drink. She walked to the window of her room. Her window overlooked the garden she had created over the years. Victoria stared mindlessly at the bright colors of the flowers. She felt completely empty inside now, as if everything she had inside her had been pulled outside and thrown into the abyss. Victoria took a sip. Really had a beneficial effect on the woman's well-being. A few days before the wedding, Greg came to visit. He brought with him two bouquets of wildflowers. Victoria, who knew a great deal about such things, restrained herself from expressing her real impression of them. Greg behaved very courteously, though he was not going to hide his rustic habits. Victoria honestly tried to change her attitude toward him, but her reluctance to give Violet away to a commoner, to someone who was going to raise cows, was much stronger. Victoria did not express it but inside her there was hope that her daughter would come to her senses. The day had come when Violetta would have a family of her own, pack her things and leave home to create a new world of her own. The wedding took place in the village in the same one Victoria had grown up in. She loved her native land, but only from afar. She didn't want to go back to her old life. Greg decided to take care of all the arrangements. Although he was from a simple family, he had some savings. He spent it on fancy tables, music, and a suit. His parents did not stay away and took full part in the preparations for the wedding. Violetta was crazy about their simple and honest communication with each other. Violetta was over the moon. She couldn't wait to finally be handed over to the priests and become legally husband and wife. The marriage ceremony took place in a small church. Everything here was just as it had been 18 years ago beaten walls, candles and icons, modest decorations in the form of angels. Inside smelled of freshly baked bread. 
Victoria experienced strange feelings. Everything was mixed up in her head. Memories from her childhood and glimpses from real time. Memories of going to church with her mother came to mind. Walks in the field Boyko cows hot days in the body tired of gnats and fun bathing in the river. Here came Violetta in that snow white dress. She looked so magical and beautiful. The long veil was coming down. Surrounded by the plume, leaving behind a white path, the priest said a prayer and made a speech, after which the bride and groom gave their consent. Then they exchanged gold rings. Greg himself had personally earned the money to buy them. Admittedly, he honestly had to work hard. After the marriage ceremony, the newlyweds and guests went to Greg's house to celebrate. The long tables were filled with various dishes prepared by the whole village. Apparently, Greg's simplicity had won the villagers over, and they were eager to make friends and help him. Though this surprised Victoria, it still didn't impress her enough. She still wanted to show her daughter what awaited her after the wedding. According to tradition, after the feast, the guests went to escort the newlyweds to their bed together, to be witnesses of the fact that today on this first wedding night, they will unite their souls and bodies. Victoria herself was in charge of preparing the bed for the newlyweds. Violetta was certainly not averse to entrusting such a task to her own mother. It was already getting dark outside. Night lights burned along the edges of the sidewalk. Everywhere hung luxurious flowers, which Victoria had specially prepared for such a celebration. Victoria walked first, then Greg and Violetta, followed by Greg's parents and guests. With each step the newlyweds approached the gate completely trusting Violetta's mother. They didn't ask why Victoria was leading them in the opposite direction from the house. Let the guests in the house have a good time. Victoria spoke, turning to the newlyweds. A smile shone on her face. None of the guests had any idea what surprise she had in store. Violetta and Greg began Victoria. We all know that our ancestors first lived under one roof with a cow, which fed them and gave them sustenance. So let's not change the customs of our ancestors and for a happy and prosperous life, you will spend your first night here?" Victoria finished and opened the door. Also looking at the faces of the newlyweds, in the first seconds, Violetta could not hide her amazement. A little later her face changed. Greg and Violetta were stunned by what they saw. Victoria greedily absorbed their every emotion. The groom's parents and guests opened their mouths. But instead of starting to be outraged, Violetta turned to Mother Us. And who is this? She asked without averting her gaze. What do you mean? I don't understand, Victoria interrogated her. She was still looking at her daughter, who was more than stunned. What is he doing here? Who is this man? Violetta asked again. Greg at this time, barely holding back a smile, remained silent and watched what was happening. Victoria, finally unable to bear it, looked inside. On a white sheet that was spread out on a haystack, which Victoria had diligently prepared, lay none other than Sam himself. He was in a blue suit, lying on his side, one leg bent and one arm and head propped up. When he saw Victor, he smiled. At the same moment, the cow let out a prolonged, Victoria, my love. Sam jumped down from the stack and approached her. She couldn't say a word. When the time comes, the paths of white men converge, he said taking her hand. Victoria drew more air into her chest. She was searching for the right words. There was silence all around, and even the guests were watching intently. The woman found herself in a very, one might say, extremely awkward position. What's going on here? Asked her Violetta, I, Victoria, tried to answer anything. At that time, Sam got down on one knee and proposed to marry him. Victoria had been trying to forget about him all these years, it was securely ingrained in her mind that you can't marry a redneck. She fought with herself, suppressing her true feelings. She negotiated with herself, in the end, and a strong woman like Victoria, it worked out, she managed to extinguish in herself. That beautiful feeling, the feeling of true and sincere love. But apparently light love has so much power that even after many years she was able to get to her and make her accept it, feel it, let it inside. Victoria couldn't hold back the tears. She burst into tears right in front of all the guests. 
I think they should be left alone, pronounced Greg, leading Violet with him. The guests followed them. The party continued. Victoria and Sam were left alone. Why didn't you answer the calls to my letters? I asked Sam. I didn't think it was necessary, Victoria answered, holding Sam's hand in her palm. You're very beautiful, very smart. But I couldn't imagine that you could be so cruel to yourself, Sam said. There was silence. Victoria wasn't yet ready to tell Sam all the reasons why she behaved the way she did. She was fully giving and acknowledging all the darker sides of her being, and she could also give an explanation for her behavior. You know, I don't care what happened before today, Sam continued. I just want you not to shut yourself off from the love, the real love that we once had, he said. Victoria sighed, then looked up at him. I'm afraid I'm used to living like this, Victoria admitted honestly. I'm quite happy with my life, she said. I don't want to be intrusive, but let's try it first, insisted Sam. Unfortunately, Victoria was unable to respond to his request. The only thing she realized was that she had no right to destroy the order her daughter had followed. She had to recognize that she was not the Lord God, she was not a divine force that created circumstances, and bound two people together so strongly that if it were to be broken, it would result in great heartache earlier. Victoria is resigned to her daughter's choice, but thankfully, it wasn't that bad. Greg and Violetta moved to the city and settled here, in the house that had previously belonged to Peter's parents. Greg took up music in earnest. Thanks to Violetta's insistence, he graduated from the conservatory and became a successful teacher. This exciting, interesting work gave his family stability and confidence in the future. Soon he and Violetta had a beautiful son. As for Victoria herself, Sam managed to melt her heart. Of course, for this he had to be patient. However, and in this he was helped by his work. After all, all the ten years during which they did not communicate with Victoria, he did not sit idle. The development of dairy farming and bread, bakery did not let him fall into despondency. And this benefited everyone. After all, thanks to Sam's persistent activity, he was able to noticeably improve the working conditions of employees, as well as to introduce new technologies, such as feeders, settlements, and apparatus for bread. The bakery has also upgraded equipment and increased pay. The villagers thanked Sam. They saw him as a true manager, and the very first to believe in his powers was Victoria. Gradually, this grown woman was able to get rid of the fears she had carried through her life. She learned anew to trust, to accept, and to love. My dear, you've been in the garden too long, Sam said, putting his arm around Victoria's shoulders. Come, I've made you some tea, he added. Victoria was coming from Kiev. How nice it is to be near you, she answered. And at that moment she felt so easy. And it was true. After all, everything was in its place.